We're opening the hearing on House Bill 492 FM local relative to legalization regulation of marijuana. This is a second committee on this is going to be conducted on fairly much like a work session because uh, we have a great deal of material to go through on the goal of this. We are the taxation committee, but on since finance is not seeing this, executive departments is not seeing this, what we are doing is trying to figure out on how long it would take to do how much in order to get us in the position where we could, uh, without being dumped on by the feds, on, on start with legalized marijuana and how much that would cost, how much it would save, and then on once the thing could get rolling, how much would we get in revenue. So this is an awful lot of material. Uh, we're not going to take any testimonies, which is confined to uh, uh, marijuana is good for the state of New Hampshire, please, please let us legalize it, because that has been decided by the House floor already. So, and we have no part in that. Ours is only, okay, if we are legalizing marijuana, what does it take to do that? Uh, in the current environment or the one that may exist however many years later when we could get it done. Uh, I've got, uh, we've <coughs> asked eight different agencies to come and talk to us about their part of it. Some of them will be faster, some of them will be slower. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is take the prime sponsor first and after we do that, we're going to start with the agencies. When we have time in between the agencies, we can take uh, other people. <coughs> so, Representative Valencourt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the, the Ways and Means Committee, always my first choice, so it's good to be back before you. I understand. Sorry, Steve, you just reminded me. I, I do apologize. We have a new member, and an old member. Representative yes, Stewart from Claremont. Um, he uh, is um, coming onto the committee because Representative Azarian has left the legislature. Again, thank you, Madam Chair. I was actually, the next thing I was going to say is welcome to Representative Osgood, whom I sat on this committee with at one particular time. As I say, uh, this has always been my first choice. I understand the important work you do here, not only with first bills, but with second bills, which of course this is. And I also understand that uh, there's a lot of work to go into this before we can fulfill the will of the House, which is to legalize, <coughs> regulate, and tax marijuana as approved by a vote on the House floor of 170 to 162 a couple of weeks ago. And um, I actually have a couple of handouts I probably should start with that you can have as you work on this. Uh, while this handout is not particularly related to the finances exactly, it does deal with that. And it's also clarifying the difference between the amendment, which passed the House 210 to 127, and the original bill. This was put together by Matt Simon of the Marijuana Policy Group, and uh, he could not be with us today because he's at New Hampshire Public Radio. We're all running around my trapping bill, which is even dearer to my heart than this, believe it or not, is being heard right now. So I know we're all running around. But I wanted to give you this so you would be able to look at the lines and find the differences of uh, the original bill and the amendment. And it does have, in fact, some changes in the tax structure there as well. I also, just by way of um, letting you know the state of marijuana in the country today, I have copied for you a rather lengthy document by the Brookings Institute which um, is one of the think tanks, and this came out, I believe it was last summer. Uh, so this will give you some additional information that I think will be very helpful. One other handout is an article from the Sunday News. I know you will hear some people say that it will cost us more with um, people driving under the influence if this happens. Uh, that is totally refuted by Lieutenant Matthew Shapiro in this article, which was in Sunday's News. Um, I do have a couple of draft amendments that I can give you later. And the reason I've done that 
is because it was made clear to me by you, Madam Chair, and other people that the best agency to deal this, with this might, in fact, not be the Department of Revenue Administration. Now, I put the Department of Revenue Administration in because, as I said, as an alumnus of this committee, I know that the Department of Revenue Administration handles the taxes of this state, most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them. And I remember going round and round with a bill on the uh, rooms and meals tax and the 3% 3, 3 surcharge, and they have tremendous amount of rules and regulations that are involved in the taxes that they collect. So I do not buy the argument that the Department of Revenue Administration is not equipped to draw up rules and regulations. However, if you want to have another committee, another agency draw up rules and regulations, or any combination thereof, I'm perfectly willing to do that. You won't get an argument from me. I have drawn up one amendment that would leave uh, Revenue Administration as the prime agency in drawing them, but it would also consult with agriculture, health and human services, safety and liquor at the same time. Uh, I think I read someplace that you would prefer that uh, safety deal with this, so I've drop up, drawn up another amendment which says that the prime de department will be the Department of Safety, and that no later than June 1st, 2015, they shall draw up the rules and regulations in consultation with Agriculture, Health and Human Services, Revenue Administration, and Liquor. So those two amendments will be available for your perusal later on. Um, I want to deal with those two issues, the taxes and the regulations. And I'm glad you said you're not going to take any pro-marijuana comments. I assume you're also not going to take any anti-marijuana comments, saying this is immoral, as we heard in criminal justice. Correction, if someone wants to include those very briefly in a statement about all the things that they have to do, then, uh, then that is... I assume that I assume this committee will do the best that you can possibly do to make this bill better. In fact, I hope that the my final goal is to have you make this bill so good that it will not merely pass the House when it comes back in a week or two, but will pass by a veto-proof margin. You might ask, first of all, why this bill when you have all these other bills to decriminalize marijuana? As you know, this bill would not decriminalize it. It would go a step farther. It would legalize it, regulate it, and tax it. And to me, it's an important differentiation, and it does involve finances. If you simply decriminalize marijuana, you are still going to have a black market. You will still have people pushing it to our youth on the streets, because decriminalizing it doesn't <coughs> set up a place where people can go and legally buy it. So while that's a good idea, and I've always supported medical marijuana and decriminalization, I think the best possible solution is to go one step further in this bill, which not only legalizes it, but then regulates it. And let's face it, we don't want a substance sold on the, that's going to be potentially a problem, so we do need to regulate it, and then it taxes it. Now one senator said, one of these conservatives, I understand, that he could support this bill, but it's a new tax. Interesting, but I reject that philosophy. Most of you know me, I'm about as anti-tax as anybody here. But I also believe in tax fairness, in tax equity. You know that I long pushed for taxation of telephone poles since all other property was taxed. Well, if we tax beer, and we do, and if we tax cigarettes, and we certainly do, and I guess we tax liquor, you could say perhaps we don't tax it, we just sell it ourselves, but basically, these commodities are all taxed. It would not be fair to legalize and regulate marijuana and then let the people that use marijuana not pay a tax. So to me, the taxation aspect of this is simply part of the equity that we always strive for. This bill is based on the Colorado model and they do in fact tax it in Colorado. And I handed out to your committee secretary last week the full document of the regulations from Colorado. It's a very lengthy document. The reason I gave you that was not so that you have to go through it line <coughs> by line, but to point out to you that we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel here. When it comes to regulations, whichever agency you decide wants to regulate this, they have a basis to go by from Colorado. Admittedly, they can't use everything that was done in Colorado, but that is a very good starting point. Uh, let me just talk more about taxation because I think it's important that you, the taxing committee of the House, 
get the right level. I say that because if you tax it too highly, you're going to continue the black market. If, it, if it's taxed so much that it's more expensive to buy it legally, then perhaps the black market would continue. And I say that with a little bit of history. I lived in Berlin, Germany for a while, and the government of Germany taxed cigarettes tremendously high. And you could go to any subway station in central Berlin and see illegal cartons of cigarettes being sold by, I don't want to sound racist, but they were Vietnamese people in Germany, hawking illegal cigarettes. Now you could go to a cigarette store in Berlin, any place, and buy them legally. But they were so highly taxed that it created a black market in the subway system. I don't want that to happen here. I think the state can do very well by taxing this at a moderate level, and I suspect that none of the people that want this legalized will object to paying a tax at a moderate level. And by taxing it at this level, we are going to drive out of business the black market, which is hurting our youth. I contend that this is the bill that will stop 12, 13, and 14 year olds from getting marijuana because this bill says you have to be 21 and if you have to go to a legal place to buy it, they're not going to sell it to 21 year olds and therefore the black market, while not totally eradicated, will be basically wiped out if we do this right. That's why I believe the tax in this is very important, one of the reasons. And you can see what I've suggested in the bill as a tax structure and uh, if you want to do more, you could do that. Uh, the number of we picked, and again, this was not done by me, but in conjunction with the marijuana people who have looked at Colorado, $30 an ounce. <coughs> now, I have, the statute of limitations has long since run since I bought any marijuana. <laughs> I want to be totally honest. But I understand that an ounce is 28 grams, there uh, roughly, and people tend to buy it by an eighth of an ounce, and an eighth of an ounce might cost you around $30. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wrong. <laughs> More? <laughs> 50, all right. Let's say it's $50. So if an eighth of an ounce is $50, I assume you can buy it, a little, get a little discount if you buy more at a time. 50 times eight would be $400, right? So an, eighth, uh, so an ounce would be in the $400 range. $30. <laughs> 50 times 8 is $400. Yes. Isn't that what I said? Yeah. Yeah, but then you want the black market would still have a better aspect. Yeah, All right, well, just do this. well this, is, this is important, and that's why it's important that you hear from people like them, because as I say, I don't buy the stuff. I have professed to the Concord Monitor that I smoked heavily when I was in Amsterdam several times. But let's say it's $40, $50 an ounce, uh, $50 an eighth of an ounce, that would be $400. $30 tax on an ounce would be, what, the 8% range? So let's say it's 8, 10, 12%. If I am uh, paying $40, $50 an ounce, an eighth of an ounce, you divide the 30 by 8, so you add on the tax of what? 8 goes into 30, 3 or $4 extra for that eighth of an ounce. Math is quite, you're all experts at math, so I'm sure you can deal with this. So the tax is not onerous at that level, I don't believe anyone would object to paying it if they can get it legally at that level. If you raise it, that's your, your position, the House could raise it. If you eliminate the tax, I don't think you'll do that. I don't think it would be wise. As I say, I suggest it be taxed at a level that would drive out the black market. How much money does this make for New Hampshire? I ran some computations through my head and came up with 20 to 30 million, and then I talked with Matt Simon and he came up with the same number. This is not a number from the Department of Revenue Administration. But I want to be clear with you from the outset. My goal in sponsoring this bill was never to raise money. As I've just said, money will be raised and it will be a side benefit. But to me, you don't need to figure out exactly how many millions of dollars is going to be raised because anything that's raised, and it's certainly going to raise a heck of a lot more than it will cost to draw up the rules or to regulate it, anything is a bonus. But I would keep in mind that 20 to 30 million dollar figure until it's refuted by others. There are also ancillary benefits, as I'm sure you'll discuss with the prison department, and I'm sure that they won't give you the figure saying you're going to reduce uh, X number of prisoners, then you can multiply by 35,000. That's not the way it works. 
but there is definite some benefit that will be brought to the state by not having to have policemen go out and try to track down people for having an ounce or an eighth of an ounce or whatever of this drug. There will be benefits in not having to prosecute them, and there will also be benefits in not having to house them in correctional facilities. There's also one other benefit that I think should be mentioned, and I know, Madam Chair, with all the department heads, if you've brought in anybody from DREAD. But I suggest you look at this very closely. That is the Department of Resources and Economic Development, as you know, and they deal with the tourism department. And you can probably guffaw or say tourism, but let me tell you, this is not a small deal. I told you that I, I used to go to Amsterdam about three times a year back in my traveling days. And I figured my, I used to spend a week in Amsterdam, then I, I'd fly into Schiphol, the airport, spend a week in Amsterdam, and then I would take the bus to Berlin, where I did two weeks of historical filming and basically very productive educational stuff for myself. But I started in Amsterdam basically because marijuana was available, if not necessarily legal there. And not only did I spend money buying marijuana at one of these shops where they gave you a menu as you walked in, I also mentioned the Bulldog Tavern, but I got a hotel for a week there, I ate in Amsterdam, Argentine Steakhouse, a great thing, I shopped there, I went to every museum in the city, I spent a lot of money in Amsterdam and the Netherlands and the shopkeepers of the Netherlands benefited from that. There is no reason to believe that the tourism industry of New Hampshire will not benefit tremendously, especially if New Hampshire gets in the front of the line and goes first before other states around us. Someone mentioned to me it might be interesting to find out how many people are within a three hour, four hour drive of New Hampshire that might come here and spend a weekend talking a little and maybe taking the tramway up Cannon Mountain or walking through the flume. And believe me, you can walk and smoke at the same time. Although this bill would not allow smoking in public. So I think the tourism benefits are something else you should look at in this committee. I just thought that was important to point out. <coughs> now, as to the regulations of this, I used to be a newspaper reporter in my previous life. And you know, as a newspaper reporter, some of you here maybe are, some of you deal with deadlines. I used to work for a weekly newspaper, and I used to wait to the very last minute to get my stuff written. I used to always get it done, but I would wait to the last minute. So I suggest to you that the department heads, if you give them a month to draw up the regulations, they'll get it done. If you give them a year, they'll get it done. In fact, the person that drafted the bill, who was familiar with drawing up regulations, basically told me that. I'm not saying you should give them only a month, because this bill, as worded now, gives you until June of 2015. So the idea we're rushing into this is just not true. If this were to pass the House and Senate and be signed by the governor, you would have until June of 2015, more than a year to do this. Now, as you know, maybe I sit on the Criminal Justice Committee across the hall, I'm actually right back here. <laughs> and we have about 60 bills. In fact, that's where I'm heading after the trapping bill. And um, this stack of papers here is from Earl Sweeney. The Deputy Director of Safety, I don't know his title, Assistant Commissioner. Almost every bill that comes before criminal justice, he has not just a little handout, but a lengthy position paper. So our department heads, our commissioners, are spending a lot of time dealing with this house and helping and testifying whether we want them or not. So I would suggest that certainly in the summertime, they would have a lot of extra time to spend drafting up rules and regulations. You passed, you meaning the House, this House, I voted against it, but the House voted by a substantial margin yesterday to pass Keno. I assume that has more than a few rules and regulations that'll be in place. Everything we do has rules and regulations. So the fact that we have to spend a little time and a little money to draw up rules and regulations is not a concern to me. Because as I say, the benefit from this will far exceed any amount that we might spend to do it. The time frame, if you want to extend that June 1st, 2015 time frame, that's your decision. I think it's plenty of time because as I say, someone's been in the deadline business, you give them six months, they'll take six months. You give them a year, they'll take a year. But I was thinking that when this country was reborn in 1789 with the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, 
some of the best people in this country without internet or email or even communications that didn't take a week or so to get from horse from city to city in a hot sultry summer in Philadelphia they not only drafted the Constitution but they debated it ad nauseum mostly in secret sessions I'm glad that this won't be in secret and they got it to the states in three months a complex document like the US Constitution so to suggest that our department heads with their minds together cannot draw up rules and regulations in a suitable time to me just defines logic. I looked at some of the questions that you had posed Madam Chair and I think they're basically good questions. I don't think you need to answer them all. I don't think you'll get all the answers. I don't think that this committee uh, should spend its time drafting the rules and regulations but make sure merely that the proper procedure for them being drafted will be in place. Um, I, I think I probably have covered the two main areas that you're going to focus on, the reason for the tax and the way that rules and regulations will be drawn up. Here are the two amendments I propose, but I suggest that you'll probably want to make your own. I have no problem with you making your own. I would just remind you once again that the House has already taken a position in favor of this bill. House rules say that you may not consider what the other body or the governor will do, but that this committee is charged with making this the best bill possible as it leaves here. I have every confidence you will do that. Uh, in a sense, I envy your work because, as I say, this is my choice always as my first committee. But I do have criminal justice <coughs> and other things to go to. So I know your time is limited. But if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. If not, uh, I, I will beg off if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I have some questions about some specific elements in the statute, uh, Representative. If you could grab a copy. I of guess I better get a copy of the bill. This is my marijuana pile. Yeah. I have it in this pile. Excuse me. Uh, you, you, on uh, you, you aren't allowed to talk up. But oh, apparently, uh, we'll try to yell. We do not have the microphone system oh. that Congress has. Um, we only <coughs> record fairly well for this area. I hope this time it will too. But um, we cannot cover two rooms. We're not set up for it. Uh, Representative Hess. Thank you. Thank you, Madam we Chair. Had questions about the statute. Uh, Representative, uh, if you would turn to page seven of the official version as amended by the House. Yes. And in particular, starting at line 27. Uh, one of the things, and this concerns the administration of the uh, licensing process. Uh, one of the items in, in subparagraph uh, Roman 1, small c, uh, paren 2, close paren, uh, you have the suitability of the proposed location, including compliance with any local zoning laws. Uh, is if your belief or understanding that if this should become law that uh, it would be deemed acceptable in any zoning zone, any zoning area that is zoned commercial, generally speaking? No. This bill contains a provision that any community may opt out. If you don't want to have it sold in your community, this is based on the Colorado model again, and I understand there are some communities in Colorado that don't want to do it, you may opt out of doing it. I think that's equitable. Um, I can't imagine why a community would want to opt out of it, but then um, that would be up to them. And uh, so zoning laws would not really be applicable because there's another provision that you would opt out. And that's in the, that is listed in the handout I gave you, this one. That'll refer you to that. Um, part, page eight, line three, it says here. I understand there is an opt out provision specifically in the statute on the, on the next page. My question is, uh, would, uh, uh, from your understanding of the intent of and the effect of this bill, would a municipality have to specifically amend their zoning law to authorize marijuana facilities uh, in certain locations within the town, or would it be deemed to automatically be authorized in any commercially zoned area? You can sell cigarettes at Hannaford. You can sell beer at Hannaford. They're zoned to do that, so I don't think your question the answer to your question would be, I don't think that zoning laws would prohibit this unless you go to the opt-out provision on the next page. It's uh, meant to... Is this a follow-up on the same question? No, it's a follow-up on the next subparagraph. Yeah, could I, could I just 
ask them while you're doing this, where is the opt-out? Well, it says on this sheet, um, page 8, line 3. Um, municipality may enact an ordinance specifying the entity within the municipality that shall be responsible. That's an opt-in. It, it, well, opt-in, right. Oh, okay. It's not an opt-out. Opt-in, opt-out. Line, line 9, Madam Chair, on page 8. Line 9, the municipality may enact an ordinance prohibiting or limiting the number of any type of marijuana establishments that may be printed within the municipality. So is what you intend that if they don't enact an ordinance, then you can't put a marijuana outlet there? A municipality may enact an ordinance specifying the entity within the municipality that shall be responsible for reviewing the applications. But in order to, as I said, it's an opt. If they want to, they would have to go to line nine <coughs> that you would have to not allow it. If you don't want to allow it, we're not going to force you to. Just like we have a lot of local control. Um, I suggest that if you don't, we're a pretty small state. People are pretty wise. They could go to the next town or the next city. I understand in Colorado, they have so much uh, desire for this that they're limiting the number you can buy. But it, uh, yeah, a committee could do this. Uh, if I were any of you aldermen or selectmen in your local towns, I'm not either, but I wouldn't vote for that. But that's, uh, thank you for that. And as I say, the, the language is drafted in basically the Colorado statutes and the Marijuana Policy Committee. Uh, people put this together. Um, I'm not an expert at drafting, but I know you are. So I'm glad you're looking at those kind of things. Thank you. Well, part of our problem is that we are not Colorado. We have different laws and traditions and, and, and its structures, and we have to figure out how that would... And one of our traditions is to allow local control. <coughs> Representative Hess. Um, Follow-up question on the, on the next subparagraph, Representative, uh, subparagraph of print 3, close print on lines 29 and 30. Uh, the department is charged with uh, uh, evaluating, and I quote, whether it, meaning the applicant, has sufficient capital, close quote. Uh, pretty vague and indefinite. Is there any experience anywhere for determining what is, quote, sufficient capital? That would be part of the rulemaking process. Uh, just like we don't allow uh, a lot of things in the state to operate unless they have sufficient capital. Banks, for example, <coughs> if you're going to start up a bank, I'm sure there are regulations and rules that you have to have sufficient capital. So that would uh, be something that would be drawn up in specific specificity as the rules and regulations are drawn up. I'm not going to go into the specifics, but uh, it uh, is just to meant to assure you that there would be safeguards, as with any business. Final question, uh, Going on to the next uh, paragraph four, uh, I can understand some of the it contents of four, but the last for, uh, provision uh, off requires the department to uh, evaluate, quote, their experience operating nonprofit organization or business. What bearing does that have on on what, what line getting on lines 32 line and 33. And seven. my question is, what bearing does that have on whether you're qualified to run a marijuana facility? Well, business experience is important. No. Nonprofit organization or business. Well, operating a business would give you business experience. Operating a nonprofit would also qualify as business experience. So if you have operated a nonprofit, you would show that you're capable of, a, just like uh, New Horizons, for example, which testifies against this bill from time to time, is I assume a nonprofit, and they have experience operating a business. The YMCA, I assume, is a nonprofit, but they have business experience. Thank you. Uh, Representative Browning. Thank you, Representative Browning, for this one. Um, obviously, you understand we have uh, quite a task ahead of us here. But the bill also calls for uh, um, anyone over 21 to be able to grow six plants on their own. That to me is like a real curveball for us to figure out how to regulate that and to how to tax that. I imagine you didn't envision it being taxed. I, I don't no. want to put words in your mouth. That's one of the beauties about this. Uh, if you want to go out and buy it, you pay the tax. If you want to grow your own, and this bill is very specific about where you can grow it. So there are regulations that would be written. You cannot grow it where it would be visible from the street, for example. Um, I think it's an important part of this bill that you could grow your own. So uh, I think that should be in there. If you and your wisdom were to say you don't want that, you want to force people to have to buy it, 
that's an issue we could debate, but it's not really regarding the taxation of it because that would not be taxed. Uh, the que you might ask the question, I guess, for your committee, how many people would be buying it versus growing their own? My guess is that it would be most people buying it. For example, I guess I could make my own Kool-Aid, but I usually don't buy that. I usually buy soda that's already made. Now, some people buy the Kool-Aid, and you put the sugar in, you mix it up. So this would be a free choice for individuals, and I don't have an answer, but maybe the marijuana experience, the Colorado experience, will give us an indication of how many people are growing it versus buying it. I don't, it's like pre-cooked foods. I tend not to want to start from scratch and spend a lot of time cooking, even though I might be able to save money if I did, instead of buying the pre-packaged foods. That's an option I have. Uh, to quantify each, you might be able to get that from the Colorado experience, but to me it's not terribly relevant because if everybody were to grow their own, we wouldn't get any tax, but that's just not going to happen. We are going to get some tax because I suspect most people will not grow their own. I, I, I'm not going to make up things for you, that's the honest answer. Think of yourself. Would you make your own beer or would you go buy Budweiser? Some people would brew their own, but not very many, I think. Not necessarily Budweiser, although it is a local New Hampshire product. Thank you. I'm Representative Young. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, I can imagine being 12 years old and having a desire. I think I'd go out behind the barn and grow my own. <coughs> we wouldn't legally. Right now, you could be going out behind the barn and growing your own. You'd be breaking the law now, and you'd be breaking the law if this law, were, if this were passed, if you were 12 years old and growing your own, and you'd be more likely to get caught then than you are now. So this bill actually cracks down on the illegal growing. Isn't it? Uh, Richard, yeah, the bill says that you can grow your own. Yes. Okay. But you cannot be 12 and grow your own. Well, if I'm 12, I would say my parents are growing it. I didn't well, do that. Well, you would be breaking the law by lying, and your parents would be condoning that, and they would be in big, big trouble. So as I say, you'd be breaking the law now, you'd be breaking the law now, you'd get the red seal, didn't I? Yes. Okay. I have a copy. The other one does not have a red seal. Why don't we exchange? Well, you know, this has my note. <laughs> this house is very stingy. I couldn't find a lined pad of paper to save my life. Thank you. Apparently we're getting more stingy. Oh, well, they don't want to, they don't let us make phone calls out of state unless you have a special offer. So, uh, any further questions? Uh, Representative Everett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Representative. Why did you, I have a question, why you chose the lead administration being safety as opposed to liquor commission? No. I didn't no, choose. He didn't choose that at all. That, what you're looking at is my list of questions to the agencies. Oh, I'm what you're looking at, looking at, at is after I sent him a copy of the list of questions to the agencies, he decided to create an amendment that said it was safety as an alternative to his amendment that thinks it's revenue administration. One of your questions led me to believe that you did not think revenue administration would be the right place, but that safety would be the right place. As I mentioned earlier, I have no quibble. Uh, safety has Earl Sweeney, so they certainly would be very well qualified to do this. As I showed you the number of position papers he's written on bills just before my committee, criminal, on even one of your bills, frankly. Yeah. I think he supported that bill, in fact. Why wasn't, but why wasn't the Liquor Commission chosen? Liquor Commission is one of the other alternatives you could put in here. It's one of the things, if you'll notice the amendment that I've said in consultation with them. You are the experts more than I am on where it should be. As I said, originally I thought it should be VRA because I thought most of the rules would be regarding collecting the tax, and DRA would be in charge of doing that. So I leave that up to your excellence. Yeah. Thank you. I believe, but I guess we have to confirm that with EDNA, that on um, rules have to be written by the agency that is going to be enforcing them. And that's the problem with DRA. Um, they don't enforce health and safety and things like that. Uh, and uh, it's the problem with any agency being the only one writing the rules. That's a classic so. example of why you are here, you have the expertise that I did not when I drafted that. Uh, any further questions about I would be willing to come back and work with you at some other time, if but survive, if, I, if I survive the trappers. <laughs>
Thank you very much. So I'm next going to call Mike Rogers from um, the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol uh, Abuse at uh, our Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's written in that uh, the Department or the Bureau um, opposes the bill, but we asked you here to answer questions that were on that sheet about about um, if the legislature does this anyway, what will um, the de department as a whole and your bureau have to do to change your regulations and your way of operating? And how long that might take, how much it might cost, how much it might save? Thank you for coming. Okay. Good morning, uh, members of the House Ways and Means Committee. <clears throat> I was, um, uh, my name is Mike Rogers. I'm the Assistant Director of the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services. And I was asked a few questions uh, uh, by Representative Almy um, that was sent to us, and we've uh, provided the responses. I don't know if you've gotten them all. Uh, would you like me to read the questions and answers, or how would you we like me to proceed? We haven't gotten any answers to my what, was the sheet sent over? Yes, it was sent over. That was what uh, the, the email I uh, received. Oh. Uh, but I, I can read the sheet and the and the answers if you'd like me to do yeah, that. Yeah, and then we will have to find our, our current new administrative assistant is away this week. Ah. Uh, the woman filling in from upstairs should be looking at, I'm not sure whether she can look at the email or not. Okay. And if you could resend it to me, that would be, uh, I don't know if you sent it to, I did not get an email. Okay, I went through the legislative, uh, legislative liaison, so we'll work that through and get it to you. Thank you. <coughs> Certainly. So the first question that was posed to us would, uh, was, how long would it take to change current uh, Department of Health and Human Services regulations to reflect legal marijuana use by adults 21 years of age and older? And uh, the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services, this does not apply to. Um, so the answer to that question is uh, not applicable. Unless you were referring to rules, and if that was the case, Representative Almy, then I can make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. You say it's not, um, well, rules is what we're talking about. Very good, uh, and my director wanted me to clarify that. Um, so our rules process typically takes six to nine months to complete. And yes. Um, and what would this be a complex change or would you be the uh, what kinds of things do you need to change? Well, we, we don't we don't really realize that yet. We uh, exactly what would need to be changed that would be based on what uh, what would be presented to our bureau. So I'm not really certain of that now. Our response was that typically for the regulations there was no change, and the rule process was six to nine months. If you need further clarification on that, I can provide that for you. I'm afraid I'm in a loss here. I don't know if other people understand the difference between regulations and rules, but I thought. Mm -hmm that in our state they were the same thing. Mm -hmm. That was the Sorry. guidance I was given. I, I apologize for that. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if we have any regulations that don't, aren't rules. Yeah, uh, I, 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 there's no difference between rules and regulations. I just had a question. I'm not sure I heard correctly. I think you said that, that there's no rules to be or regulations to be changed right now. That's, that was your initial answer to the question, is Correct. That right? Correct. And then you were asked the follow-up question, well, how long would it take to develop new regulations? I'm, I'm using that term and in, uh, exchangeably with rules. Mm -hmm. um, and your answer is six to nine months is the typical course for 
before going through the rulemaking process. Yes, Representative yeah. Ames, yes. Mm -hmm. And you don't have any idea what part of your rules you would need to? Not at this time, no. To change. Mm -hmm. um, do you spend um, considerable amounts of time now on problems of uh, adult marijuana use, or can you see yourselves changing in any way what you are doing with marijuana use? You know, typically, uh, right now, percentages of people that are primary drug of treatment for marijuana use is about 11 percent in the state of New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the only populations that uh, are uh, prior groups for us are uh, pregnant women and IV drug users. <coughs> Excuse me. But the state of New Hampshire, uh, our treatment providers, uh, we do not put uh, any anybody who uses or misuses drugs in a priority list. We do it on a first come first serve basis. So we serve a certain in amount of individuals for treatment service currently. Uh, with the latest round of budget cuts over the last few bienniums, the number of people that we've served has proportionally gone down with the funding that has been uh, decreased. But <clears throat> so what we anticipate happening with the marijuana use that you're referencing is the studies I provided uh, in the fiscal note and uh, the corresponding uh, documentation from the National Survey on Drug Use and Boost, which is NUSDA and SAMHSA, show that we should anticipate an increase of two to three times the number of people, 21 and over, that will require treatment services from the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services providers. However, uh, we aren't anticipating at this time to be able to increase that amount at all because we have no funding listed in this note that's going to allow us to increase the services that we have. So there'll be more people that want services, but we'll only be able to serve the same amount of people first come, first serve basis. So this wouldn't change your budget because your budget is inadequate for the current problem. Correct. And you would continue, obviously, to the people that come to you for treatment are not coming to you because they are referred by the courts or anything like that. They were coming to you because they are on um, addicted at a high level to marijuana by itself and want to get off? Uh, well, or are you talking about people who are uh, using multiple drugs or? That's a complex question. Most, most drug users use more than one substance. That's a blanket statement. Mm -hmm. But uh, currently, I have the top six drugs of use. Our, our real big problem right now is uh, opiates and, and heroin at combined. That's a group that's gone through the ceiling. But marijuana, what we're talking about today, that's a, a group of drugs that's gone up consistently. Currently, 11% of individuals in the state of New Hampshire uh, are seeking treatment for the dependence of marijuana in the state. Uh, and nationally, the numbers are going up. Uh, we are we rank fifth and ninth highest in marijuana dependence in the state of New Hampshire in terms of on the wrong side of the uh, equation there, that where we have more people using marijuana in our state than other states of the union. So our problem's a little more significant here in the state. Yeah. Um, the yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So the 11% is, is of people seeking treatment. 11% are seeking treatment for marijuana. Use. That's correct. Yeah, and that's an average. I took the average over the last five years. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was part of my question. Eleven percent of those being treated, not eleven percent of the population in New Hampshire. Okay. Now you mentioned that those numbers upon legalization will increase. Uh, do you have any statistics or data that uh, will back up your statement? Yeah, I provided a study by uh, PACULA of 2010, which is also supported by numerous other citations of peer-reviewed uh, articles and journals uh, to you in the fiscal note for reference. 
uh, it's pretty consistently showing that between two and three times the current rate. So if it's currently 10% or 11, we could expect up to 22% or up to 30% of individuals. And keep in mind that when, it, when a lot of these individuals are talking about statistics, this is not current marijuana uh, smokers that make up this new group. It's the new users that will be seeking these treatment services. The actual marijuana user group that's currently smoking, they, uh, that statistics are much lower for them because they will not uh, be seeking um, treatment through our services that are currently used here in the state. Paul, that's interesting. And, and I assume that that's based on places where it's been illegal and then made legal again. And then you've had enough time to study that to show that. Is that where your, your numbers are based on? And could you mention where that is? Yeah, that's the state of California. Yes, and that is the Pacula study that is being referenced. However, both of our uh, national data, which is uh, supported by the U.S. government, which is NUSDA, which is the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which is NSDUA, and supported through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, SAMHSA, uh, shows that mar marijuana use is currently at 19 percent uh, nationally uh, in 2008, and that's up from 16.6 percent. Um, I, I misspoke. It's up from 16.6 percent in 2008 to 19 percent in 2011. And uh, another statistic shows that, uh, and this is a little bit of a younger population, this includes uh, the adolescents down to 17, so I, I wanted to make sure I included that, that uh, the marijuana annual use increased uh, from 21% in 2007 to 25% in 2011, which is indicative that the younger population's rate of use is, is higher and drives those numbers up. Could you the California study, is that an increase of users that ask for treatment, or is that an increase of users? Those are treatment episodes that ask for treatment. Thank you. Uh, I'm so, I want to make sure I understand this, the 11% of treatment for marijuana. That 11% uses only marijuana? They're, they're, this is an 11 or is the 11% people who are getting treatment who are marijuana, but they also use opiates or something else? Is that 11% using just marijuana that's coming for treatment? Well, to answer your question, uh, it, it typically is, is not just marijuana. People have codependencies. And they're not, it, it, uh, we have something called a primary, secondary, and tertiary drugs that we use. Mm -hmm. So when I, I use the 11% term, that's the primary drug that they went in for. So it'll be primary marijuana, but it may be secondary alcohol and tertiary opiates. And those numbers we can provide you, but it'd be, it'd be difficult for me to go through and, and, and characterize all of those here. Uh, though I do have them, I have the top six drugs, but I could provide that data to you. Yeah, what does the 11% translate to in terms of absolute number of caseloads? Uh, for our caseloads, uh, now this is treatments. Uh, for our caseload numbers uh, in the years, um, our total for all years, uh, would you like the, the average or the number for 2012, my latest data? For the 10 year average, it's 1,012 per year that we treat for uh, primary drug of marijuana. In, in your list of uh, you know, the most frequently, the most frequent treatments for for materials, where does marijuana sit? Is it the, the most frequent? Is it fifth or? Uh, it's currently it's currently third. third. Yes, it is behind. Uh, uh, and there's been a change. Uh, alcohol's always been pretty pretty high, and uh, a real increase in, in prescription drug abuse that's gone through the ceiling, and then marijuana, uh, which they combine marijuana hashies, but hashies is is, is a, a very small component of that number. Thank you for your testimony.
online. Do you have any idea of the volume of marijuana? Can you tell how much marijuana is actually passes through the black market in the state? No, that's beyond my scope. And uh, to be uh, representative beyond, I tried to get numbers of consumption out there that were uh, reviewed and supported by by a proper source, and it was it was difficult, if not impossible, to get. Uh, the only data I could find for usage was uh, uh, joint doses that. Uh, cardiovascular pulmonary individuals used for treatment of lung and heart disease. Uh, I just could not find anything that would uh, add to the conversation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Thank you very much. I do have another meeting uh, as a sponsor. Well, uh, we have a meeting both for noon. Which we've listened to. We've listened to what? Um, no, no, I mean in our committee we listened to all those. And to all the agencies. And enacted on their yes, so misinformation. Um, is there anybody else who is going to request this? Because I do not want to keep our agencies which are severely undermanned at this point here all day. So, um, you calling me? Yes. Okay. I call Representative Robinson. Do you think the members can Thank you. Um, yes. And thank you. And, and there's nothing like coming to a hearing and you come in feeling you don't this probably is need why to say much. I wanted to make it a work session. Right. And I was overruled by an individual. When I was young in my 40s, towns in Cheshire County voted dry. It didn't work. People went out and brought the booze in. You know, you're not going to go house to house. One of the things I think we shouldn't ignore is how much money we would save by cutting the number of felons who haven't hurt anybody. My uh, granddaughter was in an automobile at college. <coughs> I don't know why she was in it, but there were four of them going somewhere, probably to a bar <coughs> in Vermont. And uh, they were stopped for, they slid it through a, yield sign and unbeknownst to her uh, the driver had marijuana in the car everybody in the car was charged with a felony being in the presence of an illegal drug after hiring a good lawyer and going through a lot of expense uh, hers was no pros. Uh this is gonna if we woke up to the fact that the reason marijuana is illegal, at least one of the reasons, is at the end of Prohibition, 35% of drinkers had decided to stay with marijuana, which had been legal all through Prohibition. And we know what Prohibition... You're going to get to the question The money, the yes. Right. <clears throat> Freeing up our prison system from people who haven't hurt anybody, but have chosen a drug that is not easy to make money on if it's legal. Uh, I have friends who come every year to our church auction where we raise money for the church and everybody brings something like, we've got two or three amateur pilots and they will sell us an hour in the air and for whatever we'll give the church. And there are people who bring homemade beer and homemade wine which is perfectly legal and we get no taxes on. Making beer is about 30 times as much work and equipment as it is to throw a couple of seeds in a window box and grow my supply of marijuana. And I think that's where most of it would occur. And one of the reasons we have had it outlawed over the years is because nobody can make a profit on it when it's legal. Uh, we had a gentleman testify who claimed to lead the mafia in this area and he said he was going to have to lay off all his people if we legalized marijuana. And that may be a little bit of exaggeration, but not completely. 
And the other thing is felons. You're found legal of a felony. You don't go to the Air Force Academy. You can't become an officer in any of the uh, services. You are branded for the rest of your life on your criminal record unless you can go to the governor and have him expunge it uh, as a convicted felon. Mm -hmm. it, it costs us huge amounts of money by branding, uh, you know, and, and if I was going to outlaw substance, and it would save us huge amounts of money if we could enforce it, would be tobacco. Biggest killer of Americans. There's oh, never been a death certificate. Yes, I know. Totally you, you are talking to the I understand, but all this involves policy. money. Yes, but we want the money quantified, is what we're trying to do. If I could tell you how much you would save, if the country went this way, it would be billions. In this state, it would be millions. What percent of the population of prisons is in this country? 25% of the world's prisoners are in the U.S. prisons. Yeah, we have 5% of the world's. About the cost of the state. And the cost of a prisoner is probably 12, 40,000, somewhere between the two. Yeah, about 35 at this point. No, no, that's the gross. That includes the rent and the yeah. heat. Yeah. You don't take a prisoner out and turn off the heat. No, so it's probably about 12,000. But when you've got 1,000 in jail, that's real money. I'll leave and, but. The savings are not in taxes increases. The savings are in the huge amount we spend enforcing and punishing people who are doing much less harms to themselves and the world. Ask a policeman who he'd rather arrest, a drunk or somebody high on marijuana, and I guarantee you he'll say somebody on marijuana. They don't fight. They don't get angry. Their brains aren't out of commission. That's right. huge savings. Could you tell us um, where the 12,000 savings without the rent, et cetera, comes from? That's just a there? guess because when I subtract, it's basic, the only thing you save is when you take a person out of prison is what you're feeding him. You can't fire the counselor because he's got 20 other counselees. You can't shut the heat off in his cell because it doesn't work that way. You can't fire a guard. You can't uh, reduce the uh, uh, payment to the guy who runs the prison. Uh, I could go on and on, but it doesn't cost $30,000. That's just an average dividing the total prison budget by the number of prisoners. And that's, nobody in business would try to say, geez, I'm going to lay off a mechanic and I'll, seeing he's one hundredth of my crew, I'll save one percent of my overhead. Doesn't work. Thank you. So it's, I guess, from looking at your county jail, maybe. Yeah, it's probably less than 12000 because I don't yeah. think we feed them thousand no, dollars a <laughs> sure month. And, I looked at your jail. and the sheets probably, you know, don't come off the bed every week. Might. <laughs> but thank you. But thank you're you. welcome. And I'm sorry I. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm That's going to call uh, David Rousseau from the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. Good morning, Representative Alamy. I'm David Rousseau with New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. And, uh, I'm going to, uh, we were asked to uh, identify some cost and time items uh, related to legalization of marijuana. And I'm looking at it in the context of, of marijuana being a crop, an agricultural crop. So I guess some of the things that I'll say will depend on where this goes as far as how it will be regulated, how it will be legalized. Um, I'm going to start with uh, pesticide. Pesticide use. There's, there's two parts to pesticide as far as considerations. If if there would this would become law, as far as use goes, the use of pesticides in growing a crop requires a license, uh, a pesticide applicator license. 
Um, and right now we don't have a category for marijuana. Uh, we do have the regulatory framework in place though because we have categories for fruit and vegetable, for example. So it would, uh, the cost or the time would involved would, would be adding a category. Um, and what we do with that is we um, identify whether or not the po folks using the pesticides are using them in accordance with the state laws and rules. So we do inspections, we do compliance audits and, and those sort of things. Um, so that's the, uh, the use part. Uh, the availability part, um, as far as what's available for pesticide use, and, and other states have run into this as well, is um, if you can think of uh, pesticides and how they, they, they're registered, if you could just think of that, and, and, and I want to explain just real quick how they're registered. At the federal level, um, pesticides are registered, and then you have pesticides that are exempt from that registration. So the, the challenge has been with, with um, growing marijuana and pesticides that are available, the states that are, have gone down that, that road, they, they don't identify the materials that are registered at the federal level because you have to follow the label and, and the federal government doesn't recognize marijuana as a, as a legal crop. So there is some challenges there. I just wanted to mention that as far as cost and time issue, that, that may not be a, a big issue for, for, the, for the Department of Agriculture, but I just wanted to put that on the table that the, the availability of materials is, is, is limited to, uh, to certain uh, uh, materials, uh, pesticides. So that, that's pesticide use and availability. And then I just want to mention that we um, register seed dealers in the state. So if the seeds uh, are transferred for sale or distribution, the, the uh, seed dealer would need to be registered. And, and one of the things we use that for is to make sure that the seeds are viable. It's uh, a check on on the seeds to make sure they actually germinate. And it's, it, that's more of a consumer protection piece. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is, is uh, we, do have, we do participate in some federal grant money, and we have to be really careful to, to not use that grant money to, to do any of our, um, uh, if we were to regulate um, pesticides at the state level, we couldn't use the federal part of it to do that. And I just, let me just give you an example. One of our um, enforcement uh, coordinators, they review cases of non-compliance and half of that salary is supported by federal dollars so I'd have to separate that that individual couldn't be involved with some of the reviews, reviews. So there is some challenges there. But those are just the three things I wanted to mention, that the pesticide, the, uh, the seed, and uh, the federal grant piece. And, and that's really it. Any questions? Can I present separate? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, would this in any way jeopardize that federal grant money? It, yes, if, if, they were, if we were using uh, uh, resources or individuals to, to deal with uh, the marijuana side of it, we would be violating the federal grant. So would, would it be an issue the department can't, can't handle that though? It's, it's going to be a challenge as far as drawing that line, keeping the separation, but I, I, I believe we can do it. It's, it's, it is going to be a challenge though. So you'll have somewhat more accounting problems. Exactly. Uh, yeah, um, this may be a hypothetical question, but uh, uh, in view of existing federal uh, illegality of marijuana and dealing in marijuana, uh, if your agency were charged with regulation of legalized marijuana in the state, number one, would you have to report yourselves to the feds as being participating in a federally illegal conduct? And number two, would you jeopardize the right to receive federal grants simply because you were doing that? We'd be more concerned with the latter part, the jeopardy, because we do have a cooperative agreement with the federal government to enforce um, the federal part of the pesticide law. I, I, the challenge would really be to, for example, we have a, a pesticide inspector, he's fully funded by federal dollars. That person could not uh, use his work to, to do any kind of uh, enforcement in state marijuana, marijuana uh, materials. I I misspoke, if I may rephrase yes. the question. No, my question is this. If the DOA is charged with certain aspects of regulating legalized marijuana here in New Hampshire, would that jeopardize your right to receive and ob obtain and use no. federal grant money per se, just because you were engaged in that sort of behavior, which is ipso facto a violation of federal law. That's a concern we have, and I, I have contacted the state of Washington, who's fully pretty much legalized, and uh, in Maine, who has medical marijuana. And, and right now, the feds have been silent on it, but it's still a concern, and, and I would like an answer myself uh, from the federal government, but right now, they, they, haven't, uh, they haven't responded. Thank you, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. 
So, from your testimony, it sounds like all the marijuana has to be grown here that's sold in our stores. And it also sounds like seed has to come from, from New Hampshire or some New Hampshire farmer that has seed that's going to sell to other farmers. Is that correct? I, I believe we would allow, allow import from state as far as marijuana seed. I don't know that, that piece of it, but, but I'm sorry. But for the, for the material that's grown here and, and the seeds that are grown here are, 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 are delivered here, that would be regulated by, by state, state rules and regulations. Law. But in most of the states, it's illegal. So you're talking about coming from Colorado or Washington state, or oh, I see. yeah. See, what I'm getting at. I mean, yeah, it, sure. It, yeah. Would be important seeds from illegal. Yeah. Uh, I, I, to, yes. Follow up. Yeah. So to me, that's that's another dilemma here. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, how do we get that initial seeds? Even if even if this, even if we grow all our marijuana here, where do those initial seeds come from? Legally, to start, is that? That's, I think that's a question. No, that's a answer. great question because how uh, a commerce from getting from the state that's legal to the state that you know there might be states in between. I don't know how that works federal commerce wise, but it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, grow very well over here. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I'll have a follow-up question after I ask the initial question. Are there different types of marijuana seeds? Numbers? You know, like 10, 15, 20? I have no <laughs> experience in, in the topic. I, I don't apologize. Yeah, I, I and you know, we're, we just haven't investigated that part of it. Follow up question? I think that I was offered at least 50 different strains of marijuana hmm. 40 years ago. Well, all right. Uh, <laughs> by <laughs> my <laughs> colleagues in graduate school. Well, I have a follow up question then because. <laughs> Which one did you pick? <laughs> <laughs> I will confess that marijuana does nothing to me. I kept on telling them sorry and taking the wine. <laughs> <laughs> my follow up question then. Is there a barcode or, or a DNA that is attached to each of the seeds? Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, do you have a, a DNA structure that you would say, okay, if that's brought into this state, we know it came from a proper source that we can regulate versus somebody that maybe brings it in the backyard, plants their six, and then hasn't been approved by the state? Is there a way to check that out? The science exists, but we don't have uh, yeah, the capability in this state. I might just point out there's uh, the bill includes on um, testing facilities to test the quality of the marijuana. Couldn't something be fit into that to uh, test the viability of the seed, and then you don't really care where the seed came from. You just care that you've tested it at that testing facility, which I think is mostly oriented towards consumers at the moment. But you could add on a section to it, which you could then regulate, perhaps. This, the germination piece, definitely. The, the, the right. DNA piece of where it came from, I'm, I'm, I'm just not familiar enough with that. Right. Yeah, it, whether it would be an easy add-on to the lab. It brings up another question, though. Will, will we send our seeds out now? It, they do go out of state sometimes for a review to make sure that the percentage that germinates is actually what the, the dealer represents. So now I'm wondering, do we even send them out of state for, for that compliance check? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, Representative Young had his hand up. And Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank you for your testimony. I'm confused about the process. Uh, the agriculture, if you will, of marijuana. What happens if we got the seeds now, we're going to grow it. Where do we grow it? Whose land is it on? Who controls it? Do we need armed guards around the fence? Uh, 
and then how do we get it from there to where it's going to be dispensed? Yeah, that, that's a question I couldn't answer. I mean, I could follow up with identifying what our neighboring state, Maine, does. Uh, I believe mostly it's greenhouse right now. And so there is the capability of, of protecting greenhouse more so than if it's in a field. But I just don't, uh, because we're not involved in it right now, I don't have a, a, an answer for you. Follow up? Is it state run? Oh, the state of Maine? No, they, um, it, no, it, it, it can, it, the grow is a private, for medical marijuana, it's, 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 um, it's a private uh, industry. Okay. Thank you. Since medical marijuana is legal in most states now, and it's now the law of the land in most places, aren't some of these types of things already in place, or being done, or are we just uh, you know, getting seeds from anywhere, is there no mention in the law? Because I mean, most of the states already have marijuana, medical marijuana. Aren't your counterparts, are this already doing this now? Isn't this already in process because it is legal in so many states? Can't, can't if, if you're, if, if uh, we allow medical marijuana here, we're getting seeds in. Aren't those seeds tested elsewhere? It isn't the same apply to other states? Yeah, I would imagine that, you know, there are, there are those issues have already been addressed in states like Maine. Well, here as well. But we're still a year away from starting it, apparently, it's been complicated getting developing this through our system. Right, my point is that in this department, this thing already exists. They're charged with this duty already, whether we pass this or not. Yeah. Have you passed on, gotten into any regulations of your own for the medical marijuana growing? No, no, we haven't. And you weren't asked to do it. It's just all by itself. Okay. But you could ask Maine, which is really close by. Okay. And perhaps some of the others that have been doing it for several years now. Mm -hmm. uh, did you send us something ahead, by the way? No, we did not. We uh, we didn't have. Um, I can certainly give you my, my notes, my outline, if that's helpful. Um, well, perhaps if, if you could follow up a bit more with uh, Maine. Okay. Just fine with that. Jill DeRocher, and I'm general counsel with the banking department, and Ingrid White here with me as deputy commissioner. Um, we were asked to speak to um, the potential reaction of the banking industry regarding the recent comments by our U.S. Attorney General Holder regarding enforcement of both the criminal and banking laws around uh, the marijuana business. And in order to respond to that, I think we need to understand what is the federal laws that are out there and the obligations of the banks and as regulators <coughs> to speak to those federal laws. Um, primarily from the bank standpoint is the Bank Secrecy Act and their requirements to comply with that as a federal law for reporting any suspicious activity that is happening at the bank. And that includes any activity that violates federal law. At this point in time, marijuana is still illegal under federal law and would require to be reported. Even though the U.S. Attorney has said, well, we're not going to look to prosecute that, it doesn't change their requirements and obligations to file those reports or us as regulators to comment on their requirements to still follow that federal law. They also have a requirement to not continue to engage in any known criminal enterprise. So again, if they know that the money is coming from a criminal enterprise and marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, they can't continue to allow that banking. So they're going to be required to report it and they're also going to be expected to cease doing operations with that as well. As far as how the banks will respond to knowing that while they might not get prosecuted for it, they still have an obligation to comply with those federal laws. And while we can't speak to how they'll weigh those risks, I understand the Bankers Association 
has or will be providing their impression of what those risks are and whether they're willing to take those. Uh, we did receive a copy of something I believe they're prepared to present to you and um, feel that that accurately reflects their description and understanding of the laws as we see it as well. Um, we do take a look at those risks and as regulators, our position and job is to assess them as well and comment on whether they're complying with federal law. And we do that along with the FDIC for banks as well as the NCUA for credit unions. And um, Ingrid White is here to speak to, as regulators, how we do that and what kind of risks we would look to. So um, I, I just wanted to, I don't know how familiar you are with the bank uh, supervision system that we have. Uh, we are from the state uh, banking department. We don't normally come before your committee, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we we uh, charter and um, examine uh, state chartered banks and credit unions, so this applies to credit unions as well. And as Jill pointed out, these banks and credit unions that take deposits from the public are required to comply with the Bank Secrecy Act provisions, which requires them to, when they open an account for a person or business, they have to know that, that customer. They have to know who the person is and take their information. Um, so they would know or know pretty soon that the business is that of um, you know, marijuana, marijuana uh, grow, growing or sales or somehow connected to the marijuana business. And once they know that information, and they know that the deposits they're receiving are coming from that, they've got to file these suspicious activity reports with the um, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, uh, which is a part of the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, they also, if it's an ongoing, uh, continuous uh, relationship with the customer, um, they have to continually file SAR reports, and at a certain point, um, the federal uh, Treasury Department may come to them and say, hey, you know this is illegal under federal law. You need to close that account relationship. Um, so this is, this is not something that we really have control over as st the state regulators. But where we do come in is we, when you, we examine, when we go in on our 18-month cycle to examine the banks and credit unions, um, we look for their risk profile. We look at their business to determine how risky it is. Are they loaning money to um, people that involve risk? Well, if they're loaning money, <coughs> for instance, to a pot business and it's illegal under federal law, could they at some point be prosecuted as abetting that business by giving them money? Um, as, as Jill pointed out, uh, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder has um, indicated through some guidance that he would not be inclined to go after those kinds of activities, but that doesn't change the <coughs> federal law. That's only his statement about what his administration would do. Um, until there's a change in federal law, it's still a risky thing for banks to be accepting deposits and making loans to these types of entities. And um, our, our position on it would be that we'd have to, um, when we're doing examinations, we'd have to comment on that, and it would be reflected in the bank's ratings, um, which indicates how safe and sound their business are. Now, is it going to shut the bank down? I don't know. I mean, I guess that depends on how risky their, um, you know, their, their business is. Um, but, you know, that's something that each bank has to consider. If they're going to open an, a depository account, they're going <coughs> to have to, they, they will be expecting that the regulators, us and the FDIC and the NCUA, are going to be commenting on that when we go in and examine them. And there's really nothing, um, you know, we can't, we can't change the way we comment on it until there's a change in the federal law that allows us to do something different. So um, we just wanted to uh, let you be aware of that. And as Jill said, the Bankers Association, we understand, has prepared um, something in writing for you, which we've seen and, and generally agree that that's, um, it's a good representation of how the industry is also approaching it, which I think is, uh, we're on the same page on this. Uh, the industry and our department on uh, understanding where we are with respect to being able to open depository accounts and, and make loans to uh, marijuana businesses. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, as a, uh, I was a banking executive for over 10 years and uh, compliance and internal audit for areas that I was responsible for. Um, 
from <coughs> the way it was back, at least back then, when you are opening an account and you know it's for an, an illegal act, you can't open the account. So That's you're right. saying that having to keep reporting, you, you are not allowed to open the account if you know it's there for an illegal purpose. So. Um. <clears throat> well, our understanding is, is that some of these, some businesses um, don't say that, you know, their, their business title may not indicate right away that, that, that they're actually in the marijuana business. They may say they're flower shops or something else um, in order to open the account, but that once the institution becomes aware of what is actually going on, they have the obligation to close the account. Yes, so rather than continuing to report, right. they would be required to close the account. Right. But you could, I mean, you know, a suspicious activity, somebody may take a deposit and not know for sure that it's illegal, that the business is that of illegal activity until you see the deposits coming through for a number of, you know, a number of deposits and after that time you'd be expected to close the account. Thank you. You mentioned FinCEN. Yes. Do the banks that you investigate or you deal with, are they aware of the responsibilities of FinCEN? Oh, yes. And the fact of money laundering is basically their main investigator. Yes. And how does this tie into what you're reporting to? Well, Okay. As far as what we're reporting, that is under the Bank Secrecy Act, and so Bank Secrecy Act requires them to file suspicious activity reports. Those are the reports that are filed with FinCEN, and so when we go into review, we would ensure that they were reporting appropriate activity along those lines, and FinCEN would receive those reports. And so, I think, am I asking, answering your question? I'm not sure. It looks like possibly not. Okay. Yeah, could I just... Um, for everybody else, I'm seeing on uh, Mr. Fay's letter here that we all got a copy of, but he's not going to testify, on uh, that the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network is what FinCEN mm -hmm. is, and I don't know whether it's under the authority of the Attorney General of the United States or not. <laughs> it's part of the U.S. Treasury. Um, is this the same type of report that would have to be made for in excess of ten thousand dollars <coughs> cash transactions, it's those go to the IRS, I believe, uh, or do they now go to FinCEN? I'm sorry, I, I've been retired are, from that long. I think what you're referring to are the currency transaction reports, CTRs, yeah. CTRs, which is they do go through the FinCEN network, um, and it is part. <coughs> that's also part of the Bank Secrecy Act. Thank you. Okay. Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In uh, October, the governors of Colorado and Washington sent a request uh, about the need of flexibility for the federal banking regulations. Do you know if they've received any response since October? I don't believe we've heard of any response. We've also recently learned, and I believe it's in the same memo that the Bankers Association provided, that there was some proposed legislation on the federal level in order to um, provide some safe harbors for uh, the the banks. I don't believe it has moved out of committee or anything yet. Um, but we, I have not heard anything further. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we already received Mr. Fahey's the three letter, a three page report from the Banking Association. But that leads to my question in part. Uh, the report indicates that at least in Colorado so far. Uh, the legalization of marijuana has been essentially a cash business with literally millions of dollars floating around. Uh, and my question is, uh, am I correct in knowing or believing that not only banks but any financial institution that deals with uh, cash in the amounts of greater than $10,000 uh, must report those to <coughs> federal agencies, uh, not, not just going across national borders, but any any place, anywhere, by anybody. Yes, there's under the Bank Secrecy Act, there's a number of activities that could trigger the filing of the suspicious activity report. One of them being if it's a known illegal activity, but other are other types of deposits like large cash transactions might trigger also that same reporting requirement. And and I believe you're correct that um, you know uh, Western Union would have to report if there's somebody came in with cash and um, so it's not just banks, it's, it's all types of uh, money services businesses that are regulated um, under the Bank Secrecy Act. 
that leads to a follow-up question, which is, you folks are in the banking business. You have state charters, you have federal charters, you have credit unions, uh, but we also have money market accounts. We yeah. have uh, financial uh, advisors uh, with that have cash accounts, all of those entities, anybody that's dealing in cash or in, in financial resources in this country is subject to these uh, reporting requirements. Is that not true? Basically. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Have you heard of something that I saw the other day, which uh, the Bank of America has told the state of Washington that they will bank their excise tax on marijuana mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because it's gone through a state and presumably been purified. Right. I mean, we, I think we recently heard that, I mean, and what we're speaking to is it's a risk that a bank can choose to take as regulators we would feel obligated to comment on that risk in, at minimum um, and then weigh that against other risks that the bank might have. Um, so it's not, and that's up to them to, to, to take that risk. So you've heard that too, though. Uh, Representative Romney? So, where we are right now, you see this, uh, I think Representative Hess kind of touched on it. You see this being a cash business in this state at this point because of the credit card issues and not being able to use credit cards because they're all, most of those cards go for banks. So. What's your opinion on that? Um, I, I would agree with that statement, although we have also heard that some credit cards are now accepting clients from that are uh, marijuana in the marijuana business. So, um, but as far as you know, what's happening in New Hampshire, I would I would imagine it'd be mostly cash at this point. And the credit cards were putting it back on the bank, saying, "Well, it's the bank's obligation to know where the money's coming from and take that." I mean, so there still remains a risk around that. The credit cards say, oh, the bank that, that is the intermediary for the credit card is, does the bank get a choice as to whether the credit card company is doing that or do they just get this, this uh, charge and decide whether they're paying it or not? I'm not sure I can understand why it was a, you know, Visa and MasterCard were feeling they could put it on the bank and how the bank could know that. But that was my understanding. I think it's all a lot of very recent developments um, as far as where people are feeling they can have some flexibility. I've never seen my bank intervene in my credit card. So, um, Representative Oscar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to get my hands around who's going to be in trouble here. Uh, you as a state agency, are, are, are you telling us uh, as the state agency, you are going to inform the banks that the procedure that they are entering into is illegal under federal law and you're telling them that. So you're not enabling them, you're telling them what they're going to do is illegal. So if two years down the road, somebody new in the federal government decides they're going to do their job and enforce the federal law and jumps on the bank, we as a state agency have not enabled them uh, willingly to enter into illegal activity. Is that basically, in a nutshell, what you're telling us about what you're going to inform the bank? Yeah, I, th yeah, I think, I mean, our, our the way we operate with the banks is we, we prepare these exam reports and we have findings in the exam reports and um, based on the ratings that they receive, um, they, they are either you know, permitted to go on with their activities or if they receive low ratings, they might be subject to um, uh, some kind of memo of understanding with our department that they have to work through some issues they have. They might be subject to more um, frequent examinations, um, you know, all the way down to yeah, you know, now they're seriously losing money and they can't keep operating, so we have to come in and shut them down. That's where our regulatory, that's what our regulatory um, scope is, I guess, that from, you know, a highly rated institution that's a one-rated institution that's just, you know, doing its job and really has great credits and, and a great asset balance and uh, good financial statements down to the, the, the poorly rated institution. And what happens is, 
if they were accepting deposits or making loans in the marijuana field, that would go to the element of the risk that they're taking. Um, they would have to identify that as a risk in their, um, you know, in the scheme of the of what they're accepting. So it might um, make their rating go down because of that. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. What we were, what we're doing is we're telling them, you know, we when we go in to examine them, we might be giving them a lower rating of something of that nature, and then the risk may come to fruition when somebody, if the federal law does not change and uh, somebody decides to come in and take some enforcement action, um, that may happen. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question again, since uh, legalization has already occurred in many other states with regards to medical marijuana, how are other your counterparts dealing with this and how are you dealing with this now? In other words, has this, how, are there all those other states where it's, uh, medical marijuana is legal, is it all cash? Or, or how, how are they handling it, your, your counterparts? You know, is My understanding is that most other state agencies have taken, are taking the position that um, the federal government has taken, which is it's still <coughs> illegal on a federal level. I believe it is mostly cash uh, business in other states. And it's a major problem in, in uh, Colorado and Washington where it's now, they now have the um, recreational use available as well. I, I can't speak to California, but and we have not reached out to those other states to look at the medical marijuana business as far as how have they been handling the banking side of it, and that is something that we could do mm -hmm. and, and get some additional information about. <coughs> this is the first time we've been asked to speak to this, especially because it's only been recently changing on the federal level with some attention to that. I think it's been pretty consistent that banks are unlikely to take this. It is a topic of conversation at bankers conferences, I can tell you that. We're finding a couple of agencies that have consulted in the medical marijuana bill. Representative Kelly was. I've been away from all this uh, money laundering and everything. I worked for the IRS. My original boss was the first head of FinCEN. So I have some idea what you're talking about here. But we're talking exceptions to this law. Are you the people that allow the exceptions to the cash over 10000 <coughs> Or does that have to be made by the federal government? No. Federal. It still has to go to the federal government. So the our reports for what would trigger them to come in and look at, say a supermarket, I mean, which normally gets an exemption, right. but would have over $10,000 in cash transactions back. Those would still have to be made at the federal level. Yes. <coughs> they're, they're reporting directly, businesses report directly to FinCEN, uh, not to us. They don't, they don't make their reports to the banking department, they make them directly to FinCEN. No, I'm talking about what you're saying, you're going into the audits. You would come up with this information. So. Usually what we do is if we find that there's, um, that they're supposed to have made a report but they haven't made a report, we'd instruct them to make the report. So then they go ahead and, and report um, what it is that they have in their system. Follow up, yes, But would you go looking into exceptions that they have with clients? Um, in other words, uh, ABC Bank and the movie supermarkets. Would you go to look and see if somebody has granted that exception? You mean if the if FinCEN had allowed the relationship to continue yeah, or something? Yeah, you went into the bank and there was a, a company, again, I don't want to be coming in, ABC Bank and, and ZY <coughs> and right. Supermarket. Would you determine if that bank had gone through the proper method to allow them an exception to a $10,000 <coughs> Oh, you mean if they, if, yeah, if, yeah, but there is, there are exceptions. I see I what you're like saying that. now. Yeah, the currency transaction reporting, if it's, an, if it's a known entity and you know why they're continually giving you over $10,000, I believe there's a mechanism. Right. I'm not completely familiar with it, but I, there's a mechanism in the federal law that allows you to have an exception on your record, <coughs> so you don't have to keep reporting it. If you know it's legitimate, you know it's not money laundering, you don't have to keep reporting it. So, yeah. Thanks. I have a question that goes back to the banking. If the state approves this law, 
and there's a $30 tax, say per ounce, okay? The state's gonna receive money from somebody. Is the state gonna be able to bank that money under the current regulations or, or? I think the state may well face the same question, which is why there was a discussion around Bank of America even being able to accept their tax, the state's tax dollars, and they were willing to, it sounds like, um, but they were facing the same questions. You might want to ask the DRA that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fahey's memo also uh, alluded to the fact that uh, issues about RICO could possibly arise uh, with banks handling cash associated with marijuana businesses. And my question is, uh, if a bank gets into trouble, RICO trouble, uh, gets charged, at, et cetera, uh, is that a grounds for revoking or suspending charters? Um, well, we would be very concerned if, if the management of a particular bank that we regulated were charged with RICO violations. Um, I don't know if it doesn't mean we would necessarily summarily pull their charter out from under them, but it would definitely be something we'd be looking at and be interested in from the safety and soundness perspective of that institution. Or there's other activities that could be done, such as removing directors or putting new directors in place. I mean, there's a number of, it could put their charter in jeopardy or it could put them in jeopardy of other types of actions, um, depending on the impact. But RICO is under the Attorney General's office, right? I would, I would think it's more U.S. attorneys, as being as a federal law, but. The Department of Justice says it's going to look the other way. I haven't heard that the Department of Treasury is going to look the other way. And there's, there's enough regulations on that side that make this difficult. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I understand. Yes, I mean, even if the Treasury was to come out and say, well, we're not too worried about this, it doesn't change the fact that the laws are still in the books. And I think until those actually change, banks are going to be in a hard place to say, well, I understand that my risk of prosecution might be down. I still have an obligation to comply with the law. I'm wondering about the risk profile, uh, which you've mentioned, and how the potential <coughs> of criminal prosecution or other regulatory um, <coughs> action uh, might, because of the illegality at the federal level of all this, um, might uh, affect the risk profile. And um, how, how would it affect, how would you determine how much of a risk, how, how to weigh, weigh in on, uh, weigh these factors into identifying a risk profile that goes then into your judgments about whether or not to initiate regulatory actions? Well, uh, I wish we had our chief bank examiner here. He could really get into the specifics of how uh, they look at different pieces of the puzzle when they go into different institutions. Um, we look at a whole variety of factors when we look at um, different uh, types of accounts that they have. Risk may, um, one big thing that's you know currently being talked about a lot in bank is the interest rate risk. Um, if you're making loans to people in a low interest rate environment and then the interest rate rises, now you have to pay out higher interest than what you're collecting on the income, on the income side. So there's a risk there that you're going to lose money. There are a whole, there's a variety of different risks um, that banks in, incur every, you know, they, they encounter every day. Um, the type of risk associated with this is reputational in a way. Um, it's the risk of um, uh, a legal risk, uh, of litigation risk. Um, so there, there are a variety of different risks. I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I, 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 I assume that this is all new. 
to you, to mm -hmm. us, that um, if this is really headed your way, that you develop some kind of guidelines, some kind of system that would be standardized that would allow the people who are ultimately charged with developing a risk profile to do so in a less than subjective fashion. I mean, I think it would look at, if you think of it in terms of, you know, we look at a bank's loan profiles, it says, how many different types of loans do you have? Are you, you know, are your eggs all in one basket or are you spread out? I mean, so that would be probably the type of analysis that would need to be made is, you know, how big is your business with the pot industry? Because obviously, if that's all you do, you're going to have a much higher risk. Because if anything happens, you're going to close down versus how big of a business it is. And so it's hard for us to really put a concrete answer on. And it's not, that's not, that's just one piece of what we look at. We look at um, how much capital, what are the assets, how is the management, you know, there's a, of the bank, there's a number of different things that go into is the bank safe and sound? Risk is how, what are the risks that are going to affect any of those key components? For instance, we look at earnings. We look at what the earnings are. Well, if they have a high earning account in the with a pot dealer, you know, maybe they've got high earnings. So that might improve the rating on that side. But then on the risk side, they're down. So it's, it's a balance. And keep in mind that we're not the only ones that go in and regulate. The FDIC and the NCUA come in as well. So even if we determine that something may be low risk because it's legal in New Hampshire, doesn't mean that the federal agencies that come in and do the same type of examination that we do uh, would be on the same page as us. And that's another risk. Are, are, you know, is the bank doing something that, vi that puts their federal deposit insurance in jeopardy? What is OCOA? OCOA? Uh, the second one you said after the FDA. NCUA. Uh, NCUA, NCUA, the NCUA. National Credit Union. National Credit Union. The agency that um, insures credit union deposits. Oh, so this would be the one Comptroller of the currency does the national yes, the bank. FDIC does everybody? All the banks. <laughs> everybody. Usually it gets in from the And then there's a consumer financial protection bill. Correct. I know that happens, but apparently it also gets involved in this. Yes. The bank does. Yes, uh, Rep. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure where we are in this federal, state, whatever organization thing. But who would be responsible to make sure that these banks in New Hampshire <coughs> give the proper training to their personnel? Again, the Bank Secrecy Act has been here for a long time. <coughs> but to make sure they know the regulations and follow them regarding currency. And I just give you an example. Back in the 80s, the Bank of Boston had a teller in the north end of Boston. <coughs> he used to allow the Anjul crime family to walk in with shopping bags full of cash and put them in. At the time, I gave you $5,000 with the CPR pool and just ignored it. <coughs> Until we got in and investigated. And then management all of a sudden became aware of it. And they walked in and gave us a check for $5,000 to pay the penalty. As an aside, I have a t-shirt that says I do my laundry at a bank in Boston. <laughs> but anyhow, who, who is responsible for the training? Is it at the federal level, the federal level, <coughs> to make sure that these people are aware of what they're supposed to do? The employees, not the manager. Right. Well, it is a, it's, a federal, it's still a federal law, so, uh, but we do examine, we do also examine for Bank Secrecy Act, so we, we do look for the compliance in that area. We don't generally do compliance exams. Um, but that is one area that we do look for compliance. So it is us and the FDIC. Both of us look at that. I mean, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but we are all of a sudden coming into a whole brand new area of currency transactions that are going to become involved with this doctor have marijuana sales. I mean, drug sales have been there on the legal side, but we start to make them legal. It's going to be also an awful lot of cash transactions similar to what we're going to have with the seniors if we have to prove that. I just want to make sure we know who's, who's doing what about the cash. Thank you. 
So, Representative Hess. Thank you. Uh, I've been, you mentioned the FDIC, which I haven't seen in the materials we had. Uh, could a bank's eligibility for the participation in the FDIC program be put at risk for some of the things that we're talking about? Yeah. I mean, can a bank function without FDIC? No. 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 If you're a bank, you have, to, you have to participate in the FDIC program. Pretty much. If you're taking deposits, yes. And a further question, Madam Chair. I, I noticed one of the letters in, the, in this package from the Attorney General's office uh, is addressed to Ben Bernanke, the chair of the Fed. Is the Fed involved in this kind of I mean, regulations that we're talking about here, as well as Treasury? Um, yes, the Federal Reserve. Um, I don't know how I can explain this relationship, but some banks choose to become members of the Federal Reserve and have oversight by the Federal Reserve. So in that sense, they do become the, the, um, the regulator for that bank instead of the FDIC, but the, the bank still is required to have the FDIC insurance. So and I think we have a couple of banks in our state that are Fed members. Uh, state, no, actually, um, it's actually uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember which particular ones. Um, but they don't, you don't have to be a large bank to be a member of the Fed. Small community banks also can be. Um, any further questions? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Oh, uh, let's say, you have a memo from the Attorney General? I have a memo here, a copy of a memo dated August 29, 2013, from DOJ from the Office of the Deputy Attorney General James M. Cole. Yep. I assume since I have it, everybody else got it. And attached to that is uh, uh, a letter from some of the Colorado congressional delegation to. I don't have that. I don't have that. Oh, I've never seen well, it. I'll be happy to give you my annotated so version. Must have been one half. <laughs> Maybe you only got part way around. <laughs> That's it. You're holding it right there. Regarding marijuana enforcement. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and if, but if you go back. I think everyone got it for the two of us. Okay. Also attached to it is a letter from the Colorado delegation, congressional delegation, to uh, the director of FinCEN. Right and uh, Deputy AG, and also a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, Chairman of the Board, uh, Federal Reserve Board, Chairman oh, of the I FDIC, Chair, uh, uh, Controller of the Currency, NCUA Chair, and Consumer Financial okay. Protection Bureau Director. Okay, who does not have this? Uh, yes, Representative Osborne. Uh, does doesn't have anything that we handed out earlier. Uh, so how many people do not have this? We need a copy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, Backup copies for a pink card. Uh, okay, so uh, corrections has arrived and has not yet produced a pink card. Ah, okay. Um, I do need you to fill out a pink card, this isn't enough in the committee rooms. Yes, I shall do that. So Bob Mullen, the Director of Administration for the Department of Corrections and CPA, which Correct. should be helpful. Uh, did, did you see the list of questions about uh, what we wanted you to talk about, the savings that you might get from 
people not being in the state prisons because they were only there for marijuana and uh, whether this would reduce. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the first question that uh, I have been given is how many fewer people would be in state prisons by the end of the second and fifth year if this bill passes? Uh, the short answer is it's indeterminable. What I can tell you is within our state prison facilities, whether uh, it be in uh, any of our three prisons, we presently have five inmates who are imprisoned for the charge of marijuana uh, possession of one ounce or more than one ounce. So it is a, <clears throat> there's a small number out of the 2,600 plus inmates that we have uh, in our prison system. Mm -hmm. okay. So this uh, would, would be a minimal effect on you. I'm sorry? This would be a minimal effect on you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, how many of these uh, of them uh, incarcerated people are there who have been incarcerated because they had some other crime, but it was added on because there was also marijuana involved? Okay. Uh, in the prison system, as of as of today, there are a grand total of 94 inmates who are in our state prison. One of the charges being marijuana. Okay. Uh, the five uh, inmates that I mentioned are the people that are in prison for strictly marijuana charges. Uh, of the 94 people that are in prison, which includes the, uh, those people, it would be uh, other charges such as burglary, criminal threatening, witness tampering, uh, possession of something other than marijuana, cocaine, heroin. Uh, the question that uh, I address with the five uh, inmates is the people that would be in prison strictly because of marijuana versus other charges that were in the sentencing or in the indictment. Thank you. Follow that, Chair? Uh, doesn't marijuana increase the sentence? And uh, first part of my question, and the second one uh, is that the prosecutor for Londonderry told me he felt that 50 to 70 percent of his prosecuting drug cases are uh, marijuana related. So that doesn't quite jive with your numbers. So what happens with all those people? Between correction to the yeah. uh, I can't comment on that. All I can comment on is the uh, sentencing notices or the indictments that are passed down, the minimuses from the courts on the charges and why people are sent to prison. I, I can't uh, comment on the correlation between a marijuana <coughs> charge and a burglary charge or a witness tampering charge. Uh, I don't. I don't have that information or that opportunity to comment. First part of my question. I'm sorry. The first part of my question. Uh, you just have to speak louder. Oh, the yeah. first part of my question. Yes. Uh, Could you repeat the first part of your question? Yeah. The, the first part was how much is added on as a marijuana infraction. So you have those figures of how much time has been added on because of marijuana-related uh, uh, infractions. With these. I believe that's up to the sentencing judge. Uh, it's my understanding that the charge of marijuana possession, or um, r regardless of whether more than an ounce or intent to sell is a certain uh, length of time. The other charges, again, whether it be burglary or whatever, that would be a separate sentence that could could be added on, whether it be concurrent or consecutive. Uh, Madam Chair, I out of the five that you've identified, is it possible for you to tell us how many are under 21 years of age? Uh, of the five, there is nobody under 21 years of age. Your numbers would not include um, people that are at any of the county jails for marijuana possession. If their sentence was less than a year and they didn't go to the state prison. So the numbers that you're giving us are just at the state prison level, not people that are also, that may be at the county level, county jail level. Yes, is that, that is correct, correct ma'am. Uh, the five people that we have in are in for felony charges, uh, which is uh, the 
shortest sentence is one to three, and the longest sentence is 10 to 20 of the five individuals. So would these folks be dealers or just had were caught with one ounce? Uh, is there a distinction between uh, dealers versus someone who just was caught with one ounce of marijuana? <coughs> yes, there's a distinction between uh, possession of marijuana versus intent to sell. There's also a distinction between the quantity of marijuana. Uh, of the five individuals that I uh, commented on, three of them are in for uh, possession of five pounds or more uh, with intent to sell the second offense. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you may not be able to answer this question, but I think this is part of the equation. Uh, I think that, as far as at the county level, uh, the, their population of the county chairs, it's a very large part of their population are people who are waiting court action, who may eventually be sentenced uh, as penalties and wind up in your system. Uh, now, is any, do you have any information on that? I think it's a question we need to, we do we do need to know about because that is very part, much of a part of the of the cost equation of that we're talking about. Uh, I'm unable to answer that. Uh, we wouldn't. Uh, know who is in the county jail or when uh, waiting trial or waiting sentence and uh, we don't get that information until the superior court judge issues the order for them to be sent to prison isn't there a central database where we can find out uh, information regarding the 10 county jails about you know why people are in there and then perhaps get a sense of how many of the of the uh, inmates incarcerated for less than a year in the state may be there because of marijuana related uh, behavior? Uh, if there is a, a database, I'm unaware of it at the state level. I think it would perhaps would be at the uh, individual county level that would have that information. I could tell you on the basis of my county that we asked that question on a couple of years in a row and I think about four years ago they Put, pulled together some kind of, of statistics, but they were a little vague. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, they claimed that nowhere near as many people end up in the county jail just for marijuana as even, well, we have less people in our county jail, so maybe it's about the same percentage. Mm -hmm. But they can't give us the, gotcha. it's marijuana plus these other things. <laughs> Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so have people here been in the state in the past been convicted of these uh, crimes? Could you, could you speak up have they been convicted of these crimes and then also sent incarcerated elsewhere? Does that also occur here in New Hampshire? Okay. Um, we pay the, the, the prosecution, we pay all that stuff, and then we incarcerate them elsewhere? Do we send prisoners to other states? Yeah. Okay. Um, we do send prisoners to other states on the interstate compact, when, which uh, all the states are members of. So we could be transferring a prisoner to another state in return. We would get a prisoner from, uh, from one of the other 50 states. Uh, generally, the interstate compact is used for uh, inmates who are, could be at, at risk to be in our prison system or, uh, you know, or vice versa. We may get an inmate uh, who could be in danger by being in prison in their particular state. Uh, so we do have prisoners that we do trade then we could convict somebody for a crime of, say, it was a burglary or something, and send them out, uh, or they convict of marijuana law here, and instead we get somebody back in the system who was convicted of a, some different crime other than that. So we've already incarcerated the marijuana uh, person prosecuted. They're elsewhere. We might get someone in from yes, some other crime. So. Yes, that, that is possible, but the interstate compact uh, arrangement is generally not used for uh, crimes of that nature, it would be uh, used of crimes of uh, such as uh, danger to the inmate or uh, high risk or somebody that, that may be a uh, behavioral problem within our system just because of other people that are also involved in that similar crime within our, within our prisons. So we may, uh, for example, there's certain inmates that we will send to a, uh, to a different state if there's two or three inmates involved in a murder. Uh, 
that might testify against each other. We don't swap a pot president for yes. another pot president. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I think that it's a fairly, you don't do a lot of these swaps. Uh, no. No, we don't. We do, we do the swaps that we feel uh, that we feel are necessary, and so, as all the other states do. Yes, but you aren't swapping hundreds of people a, a year. No, no, no. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, we may have a um, an inmate that has been convicted of a crime that is in law enforcement, and it uh, it would behoove us and that inmate that uh, he not be in our system. So that would be an example also of yes, yes. trading. Right. Okay, uh, any more questions? Thank you very much for coming in. Okay. And mm -hmm. if you could fill out one of those pink cards. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Right mm -hmm. So, um, the Liquor Commission mm -hmm. is here. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Craig Bulkley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the uh, Commission, and this is Lieutenant Jim Young from our Division of Enforcement. Good morning, Madam Chair. No, I have not. I'll, uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I have the questions that were posed to us through uh, Michael Kane, and uh, I can start with uh, the question, would it be feasible to make some or all liquor outlets the sales points for marijuana? Uh, and uh, none of our stores are large enough or configured properly to handle a dispensary operation without negatively impacting <clears throat> the sale of product alcohol. If we had to carve out an area that would be appropriate for a dispensary, we would be removing uh, quite a bit of, of alcohol product. Uh, it would then be a matter of determining whether that product is more or less profitable. Um, but there are other factors as well. Um, I happened to be at the uh, eye doctor a couple days ago and picked up a Time magazine and came across an article, which I will leave with a chair, uh, <clears throat> entitled Pot's Money Problem. And it's basically a compilation of stories about Colorado and uh, their issues with getting uh, marijuana, the marijuana approval, of basically the law, to, to put it uh, to the point where dispensaries could open and uh, proper regulations were in place. But the uppermost factor that the governor charged the committee with was the safety of the people dispensing this product. Because as you can imagine, uh, it's going to draw uh, attention to those who perhaps don't feel like they want to pay for it, but rather want to steal it. So when we look at our stores, they're really not set up for that kind of an operation where you're going to have uh, a fairly long counter with products stored behind it. And then depending on how the state chose to uh, uh, locate the actual grow, uh, the plants that are growing this product, in Colorado, they're oftentimes in the back room behind these dispensaries. So it creates a, a, a major problem relative to the space that we would have. So if, if the Liquor Commission, if this bill were to pass and the Liquor Commission were asked to sell this product, we would have to go out and lease new space. And depending on how many dispensaries the legislation called for, you know, whether that was 10 or 15 or 20 statewide, we'd be looking for space that would be appropriate and adequate for a dispensary of this nature. Uh, Mr. Buckley, sure. we're not talking about the medical marijuana law. I know that. Uh, so there wouldn't be a dispensary. 
Well, and you're going the to have. It would be that it would be grown somewhere else and uh, sold. Correct. To... Maybe I'm using the wrong term. A retail okay. outlet. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, <coughs> so those retail outlets are going to have to be staffed. We are. We do not have the staff for that, obviously. And each of those locations would require at least uh, a manager and a clerk to provide service. And I would expect that as long as as many hours as those stores are open, that we would require at least one security guard on premise. Now, you also asked for us to uh, respond to some of the questions posed to uh, the Department of Safety. So I'll work my way through those pretty quickly. The first one, would you, would you be able to be the lead agency or would it work as a branch of the Liquor Commission? Uh, if the Liquor Commission were to, were to be the lead agency, we would probably look to try to organize the operation similar to the alcohol industry in New Hampshire using the three-tier system where you have effectively a manufacturer or a grower, you have a, a wholesale or middleman and then you have the retail uh, locations. Uh, how long would it take to write regulations for a system that rep uh, respects the requirements laid out? Uh, it took Colorado more than a year to build a market that regulates marijuana from seed to sale. And I would expect that it would, it would, there would be a similar time frame involved here if we were going to do it right, correctly. Uh, and I'm not sure that there wouldn't, it, the time wouldn't take longer if there were interagency coordination where once the regulations were written in draft that they would be shared obviously with multiple uh, agencies within the state. I would also tell you that we are not staffed, the Liquor Commission is not staffed to write these regulations and that would require some personnel, perhaps two or three personnel to do the research and actually write the regulations. Um, and I would point out that over the last five years uh, in an effort uh, where the legislature was uh, enacting austerity measures, we lost a number of people from uh, this particular area within the, the division of enforcement. So right now we're, not, we're understaffed as it is given our missions. So this would certainly put a burden on us and uh, depending on how many people we, we receive to be able to do this work, uh, that would re reflect on the amount of time that it would re re require to complete it. Uh, you asked the, whether there was a need for additional staff and, and uh, our, our answer is a resounding yes. Uh, the number of personnel would depend on how many retail, dis uh, retail locations were involved. Uh, there would be a direct correlation between the number of stores and the number of store personnel required to manage and run the stores. Uh, again, uh, also with security personnel. If we had 10 dispensaries, we'd need 10 managers, 10 clerks. Uh, the marketing division would need at least three additional personnel at our headquarters to support that operation. The enforcement division would require a major uptick in personnel to include one lieutenant, two sergeants, and one administrative assistant at division headquarters along with three licensing specialists, two can auditors. Can you give us a copy of that? Uh, I can send it to you. I mean, it's get it all down. certainly uh, 15 liquor investigators. Uh, and this number would vary depending on the number of retail locations. Uh, and I, did, I have not identified the number of security personnel, but if, if you would expect to have one security individual on duty while the store is open, you would need more than just that one because that individual could be sick or on vacation, so you'd have to have some additional personnel to be able to fill in. How long would it take to set up the oversight and enforcement system? Uh, we would expect that hiring and training liquor invest investigators would take up to a year. We typically, once we hire them, we send them to the police academy uh, and they go through other rigorous training before they actually uh, go out onto the street. Other positions could be filled in approximately <coughs> three months. Uh, the cost of function, uh, your question regarding estimate the cost of functioning system to the state above current expenditures. 
Rough estimates would require over 2.3 million for enforcement personnel for licensing and regulation. Uh, and there would be additional costs for the loss prevention security personnel in each of the retail locations. Personnel to staff the dispensaries would cost about 120,000 per retail location and approximately 175,000 for three headquarters support personnel. These are rough numbers because we really haven't had that uh, long of an opportunity to research this and, and really peg those down. Uh, the final question, or the second to last, is if this bill is amended to include these need, uh, and, and goes into effect July 2014, when, you, when would you be ready to start sales and taxations, assuming the first supplies would come not from legal growers but from unspecified sources? I'm not quite sure what that question means. I, unspecified sources, I don't think the state can purchase illegally, so I'm not sure where the product would come from. But uh, it would take at least, as I indicated before, a full year to put the regulations in place, reg uh, rent the <coughs> space required for the retail locations, and hire the appropriate personnel. And as regarding the last question about how much marijuana is consumed uh, by citizens over the age of 20, uh, we really don't have an idea on that. Yeah, that's was a question for safety more than for you. Um, I would say that um, that was on um, assuming that that the legal growers were going to be making providing the supplies and you were not going to be involved in that or safety was not going to be involved in that, then how long would it take to get sales and taxation up? So um, so your answer to that one is? The, the one about uh, the where the supplies come from? Yeah, if, if the bill passes at the end of uh, this, this session, session um, then and so you don't have to worry about where the product is coming from. Again, I would say, it, based on what I've given you uh, in my testimony, it would take at least a year to get the regulations in place. And as, uh, as is evident by <coughs> particularly looking at Colorado and the history of, uh, of their efforts. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, if you were going to do it, do the retail part of it, the, the acquisition. You develop bottom line numbers for what it would cost to get up and running, you know, initial costs, and then number two, annual annual operating costs, given certain the assumptions you can use on major. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Hess. Uh, we have not, because I, I have not included what the cost for renting those facilities would be, uh, and obviously utility costs and, and, and other costs associated with uh, leasing the space. Um, certainly, if uh, if the committee requires that, we'll put it together. I would love to have a back of the envelope uh, figure on that. It doesn't have to be down to the last penny, but if we could have just a ballpark range of, of that figure, those, those numbers, I think that would be very helpful to us. We can take a, 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 one of our liquor stores that's about the size that we would expect a, a retail outlet to be and take a look at the annual costs and provide that. There's one additional point that, that uh, I read in this article that I thought was most interesting. It says, one of the major issues uh, was beyond the state's control. Federal law prevents banks from transacting with businesses connected to so-called Schedule One drugs. That means the array of companies based in the 20 states plus the District of Columbia that allow medical marijuana sales cannot legally do business with a financial system. I thought I just thought that was interesting when I read it. Yeah. I wondered, uh, you know, it talks about people carrying around upwards of a hundred thousand dollars in cash in knapsacks, mm -hmm. you know, tr moving it from one location to another between a a grower and a distributor or a, and a uh, a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. So that the security and the safety issues are certainly paramount with uh, any kind of a program like this. 
So, we located our big barn stores on the States, Portsmouth Circle. Uh, we, we capture people coming and going from Massachusetts and Maine. So I could see this being a big dilemma for you folks. Uh, it's legal to drink alcohol in Maine and Massachusetts, but it's not legal in Massachusetts or Maine, not yet anyway, to, to, have, to smoke marijuana. So I could see you being in a pickle, even if you open retail stores uh, somewhere. Being in a pickle, having to, having to verify, well, you're going to use this product here. I guess you could use it. If you buy it here, you've got to use it here. I don't think you can buy it here and, and transport it back. I don't, I'm not quite sure how the law works. So I, I, can you want to comment on that um, dilemma? And how would you police that? Well, first of all, I, I think you'd, you'd have to be carding literally everybody that walked through the door to find out where their address is, where, where they live. Uh, and certainly if they were from Maine or Massachusetts, you wouldn't be selling them anything. Uh, they'd have to prove somehow, uh, and I would assume the regulations would address this, they'd have to prove that they were residents of New Hampshire. And, and that's, that's why I think that security force is going to be paramount because you're going to have folks coming in there and, you know, wanting to buy and not, and being denied and having the issues that come up with that. I believe Colorado and Washington have tried to work out, because the federal government requires this, uh, work out ways that they are approximately complying with that. Perhaps safety can talk to us right. about, about how that's working in that particular section. As you're looking at costs, uh, I assume most state agencies would have to have liability insurance uh, as part of their operating costs, uh, like most businesses. And so I'm wondering is, you know, what would be the cost of liability insurance and can you even get it to cover liability arising out of this? Representative, thanks for the question. And I would say that the, the people to ask on that would be risk management and the Department of Administrative Services. I don't know. Uh, what coverage the state currently has relative to liability, but uh, you may be right that in fact they may have to dramatically increase. I don't. I don't know. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, first question, since the Representative Bryan brought up, I don't believe we enforce the laws of other states. We didn't do that with fireworks. We don't do that with our own liquor. We don't uh, carve the way to come through. So. Separato there, we do have a letter that went to Colorado and Washington from the feds saying we will not dump on you if you do these things, and one of the things is that. Right. But not but saying they can't get it, saying they can't take it home. Right, but Madam Chair, it was never the job of the fireworks dealers to ensure that the, the fireworks were remained in this in the state. And the same thing for other items that were legal here and others. It is not our purview or our cost to ensure, enforce those regulations elsewhere. So uh, given with that, now Representative, but that was a statement there. But uh, I'm so thank you for your testimony. But part of your, what I hear you say is that 2.3 and 1.2 million are roughly uh, under two and a half million dollars is, is in the ballpark of roughly what you expect for operating costs uh, from your testimony. And also you mentioned the capital costs. Now I noticed there was big, large expansions on the two of the major uh, liquor stores that we have here, and, and that those are increased by how many feet? Well, they're going from about 8,000 to 20,000. 20,000. And in that 20,000 foot facility, is, is, is it possible that there is enough room in there for a partial retail outlet for marijuana sales in, the, in that size and scope? And especially if the product uh, profit margin is greater than probably 40 to 50 percent of your product now, <coughs> would that make sense then to have that be used as a facility? And wouldn't that automatically already a budget for including those expenses now? Uh, Representative, I would defer to my commissioner for that uh, because I have not been involved in that project. Uh, the, the stores on the highway are being enlarged to that size, but a lot of that space is for storage that they really don't have now. It's not retail floor space, but uh, since I'm not involved with the project, I can't relate to specific numbers. But, but that, there is a possibility that we've already, there are expansion now that we have some. Well, certainly in, in the retail space that we have, if, if any of you have been to our store in Nashua on Coliseum Avenue, uh, that is a 20,000 square foot store. 
And so to carve out a space of 200 or 300 square feet, certainly it can be done. Uh, I mean, that's, it's just a matter of you remove all the racking that would have been there and you have to, uh, I would imagine, cordon that off as a, as a, as a specific area. <coughs> My concern would be, depending on how the regulations were written, where, you know, providing the storage space for that product, which is going to have to be, you know, somewhat secure, uh, and other factors that I just am not even aware of at this point. So. Representative Kelly? Oh, uh, Representative Anderson. <coughs> uh, maybe I misunderstood, but I, I think uh, your response to this entire set of questions assumes that the delivery system for marijuana would be the same as the delivery system that you currently employ for liquor. In other words, state-run liquor stores, um, those would be the retail outlets, and you identify costs associated <coughs> with um, expanding into this territory under that model. But um, it's, uh, and maybe you can't respond to this, but it's, it's uh, certainly possible that the legislature could decide that the Liquor Commission is the appropriate uh, agency to take this on, but using a model more like the model that's in this legislation, which involves licensing of retail outlets to then make these judgments about security and, uh, and so forth. <coughs> so if I misunderstood what you've said, uh, I'd like to know that, but uh, if, if that otherwise, what about the Liquor Commission taking on a different model? Well, I had suggested in my testimony, Representative, that, that we would try to handle it like the three-tier system in order to have complete control over this product. Uh, if you chose to just have us regulate it by issuing the licenses and monitoring it with enforcement personnel, uh, certainly there would be a, a lower cost to that because we wouldn't be hiring people to man those retail locations. Uh, there still would be, a, a, I would say, a significant cost in the uh, division of enforcement for personnel that would be required. Uh, and depending on who had to write the regulations, if that was on the, backs of, or on the back of the Liquor Commission, it would require additional staffing to do that as well. Just, just my own information. I mean, I didn't ask this, but I don't decide to you talk about it. What size do I delivery place? So that you've got how much additional space in the Nashua now with that new store? Uh, now you're testing my memory. Um, I know it wasn't that big because it could be like no, a skating the, rink or something. The store on Coliseum Avenue right now is our largest store. Okay. Uh, and I want to say that the store that it replaced, well, the, that's kind of a misnomer because the store that was there was an old skating rink. Right. And the, the actual retail uh, space was, I would say, probably 6,000 maybe. Uh, and we weren't using a large part of the, of the back right. end of the building. We used some of it for storage, uh, but a lot of it was, was basically vacant or open. Well, I would expect that whoever writes the regulations is going to provide guidance to whatever players are involved in this, whether it be growers, you know, the middlemen, and the retailers. And I would assume that the legislature would expect that somebody's going to enforce those laws. And the only way you can do that is to have somebody uh, available, like our investigators do currently for alcohol laws. They go and they visit established or licensees who handle alcohol to make sure they're following uh, appropriate uh, laws or the laws that apply to uh, sale of alcohol. Well, they would also go to the retail outlets to make sure that that operation was 
was being done according to law as well. <clears throat> yeah, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. We would anticipate um, the enforcement being very similar to what the alcohol is, so it would be of great concern for us for youth access. That's something that we would have to monitor diligently like we do alcohol. Um, so in addition to monitoring all of the retail establishments, <laughs> we, we would have to oversee and make sure that both at the retail and the mid-level and the manufacturing comply with all of the regulations as they're written. Madam Chair, approximately 22 for enforcement. Yes. So beyond youth access, uh, access, I'm just trying to understand, even for the liquor, what, what are the other things you do? Um, or is it primarily youth access? For this part for the enforcement, youth access would be a big chunk of that. But um, if I could relate it to alcohol, the other, the other big chunk in alcohol is the over-service. So it would just be seeing that they're not consuming this, whether, um, whether they're in vehicles um, and, and the parking lots um, outside of the establishment. And uh, also, we, would, we do get involved now when there is an alcohol issue, when, there's a, um, when alcohol is a contributing factor to any crashes. And it comes from places that we regulate it. So if somebody's involved in a major crash, alcohol is a contributing factor, and they came from one of the licensed establishments that we oversee, we certainly get involved in that back end of the investigation. So I would see the same thing happening with um, anybody that was involved in crashes under the influence of marijuana <coughs> that they purchased legally. Okay. How many enforcement personnel have you got now? We have 26 positions. We have 22 of them filled. The 26 or whatever that you have now, that they would be involved with enforcement at every every place that's got a, a licensed core, correct? So they every restaurant and whatever. Where here we would be <coughs> talking about a much smaller number of places that would be selling it, especially if we were looking at the liquor stores, and if, if it was going to be sold through the same outlets as, say, liquor stores, you wouldn't probably do it in every one of them. If you were talking about having 10 or 11 locations throughout the state, you would need 22, you would need two enforcement people for every location. That seems. That, that seems high because you we're talking about you know potentially 10 or 11 locations it doesn't it seems like 22 enforcement people would be a, an awful lot for that number of sales outlets i'm sorry to confuse you I, when i was doing my testimony i mentioned that we were looking at, at approximately 10 liquor invest uh, investigators sworn officers okay so you were um, yeah. um, so you, were, you would be contemplating that it would be sold in every location? I forgot how many locations we have now. We have 77 locations, okay. and no, I, we were not contemplating that. As I indicated at, at the beginning of my testimony, we, we weren't clear as to how many we would have, but if we used the number of 10 mm -hmm. uh, or 15. Uh, okay, so that's, that, that gets back to my question before. Either, if you were looking at 10 to 15 locations that you retail locations, why would you need 22 additional We don't need 22, 10, 10. 22 to 10. But you, right now you have 26 that are dealing with every single place that sells liquor. We have 22 now, 26 positions, four are unfilled. Okay. So you and, and we are looking for, if, if we were to do this, and again, I, what I pointed out to the committee at the beginning of my testimony was that some of the, these numbers are somewhat dependent on how many locations there ultimately are. We guesstimated that we would need 10 additional sworn officers for investigators. That number 
could change tomorrow if the committee decided that you know they were looking at 50 locations instead of mm -hmm. some other number. So our numbers are certainly variable depending on the number of locations uh, and ultimately depending on how the regulations were written, how many, uh, how many growers would be involved, what the size of the operation would be. Okay. So, um, Thank you, Madam Chair. How many, you've got 22 offices right now, and approximately how many establishments are they policing right now? Representative Separato, um, thank you for the question. It sounds like a lot, but it's not. Um, that Those 22 um, equate to one or two per county. So, uh, generally speaking, there are two bodies per county. And um, I think we currently have approximately 5,200 plus or minus licensed establishments. That does not include the state liquor stores. Those are in addition to. Uh, so, okay, so you get it's five or 6,000 places plus uh, plus our state ones run by 22 people. Yet if we have 10 or 11, only 10 or 11 place dispensary, you need 50% of that personnel to do the same job? Sir, we are, we are seriously understaffed right now doing the jobs that we're doing. Well, I'll say this looks like it's a book. <laughs> no question, no question. And they, does this, would this include the people that have to go out and see the growing <coughs> operations and, <coughs> and the processing plants? Yes, it does, Madam Chairman. license fees would you assume that uh, in New Hampshire it might be similar when the regulations are written it's hard to answer I mean I guess it depends on ultimately who decides who's going to write the regulations obviously it would seem to me it would be obvious that you'd go and look at what Colorado did what Washington is or is it Washington or it is Washington. Washington what those states that have already implemented have done uh, and instead of recreating the wheel, if you find something that is manageable and doable here in New Hampshire, that it would be logical that you probably try to put that in place. Obviously, there would be some tweaks here and there to uh, account for uh, specific requirements for our state, but sure. I mean, we're sort of talking to two different scenarios here, too. We've been sort of concentrating as if you were going to be the seller rather than regulating places like a like a place that a restaurant that pours liquor is a different thing, and there could be different marijuana in retail uh, privately owned. So it's, that's kind of two different ways of looking at. It. Correct, and and obviously the regulations would reflect that, and as would uh, the amount of personnel required, depending on how it was laid, how the regulations were written. And I presume that the bill uh, waiting this committee, if we decide we can get it done in time, is going to have to answer all, all of these questions and not leave them up to regulations to figure out. Fees and, and who's running it, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Um, James Vara uh, from the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office. Ah, thank you. We'll make copies of that too. Uh, for the New Hampshire uh, Attorney General's Office on. I will say uh, we asked you to come and answer specific questions about this. Um, you can say you're in opposition to the bill, but you're here to talk to us about if we're going to do it on how, um, oh, 
We didn't ask you any questions. There were. Yes, there were. Yes, they're, they're on there somewhere. Yeah. I, I hope there were. Number they four. Come with them yes. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to ask you specific questions. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if this bill gets to final passage, then how do we do it? And the first question, and there was not, the first question, if I may, was please take us through the U.S. AG's instructions to the states of Colorado and Washington and what consequences there would be if uh, the state were not to sufficiently comply. I am, uh, was able to find and was able to go through a memorandum written by the U.S. Department of Justice, which was from James Cole from August 22nd, 2003rd, in which it does outline some of, but it does not, uh, specifically does not outline all of the regulations which the U.S. Attorney General's Office as well as the U.S. Department of Justice uh, would go through. And that meaning in jurisdictions, and I'm quoting from this, in jurisdictions that have enacted laws legalizing marijuana in some form and that have also implemented strong and effective regulatory and enforcement systems to control the cultivation, distribution, sale, and possession of marijuana, conducting compliance with those laws and regulations is less likely to threaten the federal priority set forth above. And that question is it does not uh, specifically, and I, I must stress, does not go through what those strong and effective regulatory and enforcement systems are to control it. So it does not give the state guidance specifically related to how those things should occur. So it does not in any way uh, provide a framework of how the state should comply. And I will also stress there is a, because there was, after this memorandum came out, those of us in the prosecution community, which myself I am a part of, that is my main function at the Department of Justice as an Assistant Attorney General, a part of the Drug uh, Prosecution Unit, as well as the Drug Task Force. I'm the attorney for the New Hampshire Drug Task Force. It does, it does, did cause, I apologize, some concern of what the federal government's role in the prosecution of marijuana is and would be in the future after that memorandum came out. There is a memorandum which I have in front of me, which I certainly can provide by U.S. Attorney uh, for the District of New Hampshire, John Cavis, dated September 19th of, this, of 2013, which does discuss federal marijuana prosecutions, in which he does indicate that there was a mistaken impression that the U.S. Attorney General's Office from the District of New Hampshire will no longer prosecute case in, cases involving marijuana. Uh, he does indicate that that was certainly a misimpression and to and he assures those involved in the federal and state law enforcement community that nothing, and I quote, nothing could be further from the truth. So that is something I certainly wanted to go through in addressing the U.S. Attorney's Office's position. In going further, in terms of the second question of how much time is taken with the investigation and prosecution of <coughs> marijuana possession, trade, and prosecution, or, I'm sorry, production of cases, and this is simply related to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force, and that would be 35% of controlled drugs purchased, purchased in the fiscal year of 2012 to 2013. And that would account for 98% of the controlled drugs seized during that period of time, which is by weight, of course, because obviously it weighs certainly more than other drugs that are seized. And from the calendar year of 2013, it only amounted to 15.6% of cases involving marijuana. And again, that is strictly for the New Hampshire Drug Task Force in which there are 12 investigators throughout the state of New Hampshire, which is very small community of that, representative of them. Uh, compare these? Is it by weight or by street value? Or when you say 15%, I think it was? Oh, that's strictly by number of cases in which they, they oh, pull in. number of cases. Uh, be it prescription drugs, heroin, cocaine, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, or any other illegal drugs. There was then the question of reduction in costs. Uh, it's it's uh, simple to say that the costs are fixed, certainly for the Attorney General's office as well as the Drug Task Force. So there would be none. And any sort of, being that there's only 15.6% of cases that were involving marijuana, it's, it's simple to say that uh, the, the uh, equations would be alloc allocated and as well as investigators, investigated time, as well as prosecution. Uh, those, so the cost would not necessarily uh, be lower in any way in terms of the investigative costs and prosecution costs. Uh, the, the fourth question, will there be more investigations or prosecutions of other co kinds due to passage of, passage of the bill? It's reasonable to assume that, the that there would be an increase in other cases. 
any sort of empirical data. I certainly do not have because it certainly has not happened in the state of New Hampshire. Obviously, the representatives here certainly know that there's been an epidemic in the rise of heroin. It's safe to assume that that will continue on throughout the state of New Hampshire for the, at least the foreseeable future. Admittingly, that marijuana is not high priority in terms of what the investigators at the Drug Task Force are currently doing. That meaning, there are many a times, it's not marijuana in which one is being arrested for or the investigation is not starting. Keeping in mind that the Drug Task Force involves undercover officers, so in which they are then introduced to the target, in that many times it's other drugs, like I indicated earlier, heroin, crack cocaine, cocaine, prescription drugs, methamphetamine, and other illegal drugs. That being said, many a times marijuana is also found, or there are other cases throughout the state in which marijuana is seized, as well as the, the front line of prosecution, meaning someone is growing plants, numerous plants, and that, of course, is then seized. Now, uh, there could certainly be, and again, I'm relating some of this to what the costs are for the New Hampshire Drug Task Force. There, of course, would be other prosecution costs unrelated to the task force meaning investigations related to the enforcement of the statute and who will investigate any complaints when they come in. Obviously, that wouldn't necessarily be a task force issue because traditionally we wouldn't get involved in regulation, but those are certainly some costs which could occur. Also, it's safe to assume that there would be a rise in marijuana usage, which of course could lead to other issues like DUI, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, or Certainly, uh, the Department of Safety, who I know representatives here today, can certainly enlighten on that. Now, in terms of what effect <coughs> it may have on the budget, 55% of the New Hampshire Drug Task Force budget comes from the Burn JAG grant, and 45% comes from state funding. And Tim Brackett, who handles the budget for the New Hampshire uh, Drug Task Force, is not aware of any fiscal impact withholding grants in either Colorado or Washington. That being said, there are also other effects on the budget, which certainly could be related to uh, forfeiture seizures, in which part of my responsibility at the Attorney General's office is handling drug forfeiture uh, seizures. And from 2013, and this is strictly related to um, cases involving marijuana, there was $37,113 that was seized as a result of forfeiture proceedings. And in 2014, obviously it's a short period of time, many of those cases still could be uh, and are going on. There's been $1,517. So up to January of this year, if the total is $38,630. And the question does come up, where does that money go? 45% goes to uh, the New Hampshire Attorney General's office, which then goes to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force. 45% of that money goes to the agency if unrelated to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force uh, for, let's say, the city of Concord worked to have a marijuana case and, and there was a forfeiture proceeding which I handled, 45% would go to that agency, 45% comes to the Attorney General's office which then goes to the task force and 10% goes to Health and Human Services. Now that, again, is unrelated to the amount of money which comes in through that are handled federally. Certainly any cases that are involving uh, over $2,000, they tend to go through the U.S. Attorney General's office in which the agency receives 80% of the money that is forfeited, which is a huge number. Of course, greater than 45%. And just, I can relate a case that's uh, involved now, which a forfeiture proceeding is going on. It involves $35,000, the marijuana grow operation. When you're talking about the money, you're not talking about marijuana, but some sort of seller giving money. You're talking about the authority, uh, but assets and cash to that amount that you seize. Correct. And there's, a, and there's a statute in place, obviously, allowing us to go forward, which is 318B17B. Uh, Representative Bess, and then. Yeah. Yeah. General, this is totally unrelated to what the question is that you have been responding to, but I'd like your thoughts on something else that bothers me a great deal as a former prosecutor. On page three of the bill, as amended by the House, on restrictions on personal cultivation, lines six and seven require 
that marijuana plants be cultivated in a location, quote, where the plants are subject, shall not be cultivated in a location where the plants are subject to public view without the use of binoculars, aircraft, or other optical aids. And my question is, does that almost by definition preclude uh, the issuance of search warrants based upon probable cause? <coughs> that's safe. Sir, that's a safe answer. Obviously, if they're not for view, it would be certainly hard. That, and certainly Department of Safety would be willing to answer that as well, but certainly, in because obviously we're not uh, ones in which we get search warrants, <coughs> certainly done through law enforcement, but that's a safe answer, definitely. And if I may, I apologize, and this was certainly related and somewhat to buttress off your question. Uh, there was discussion in, in the statute of uh, no more than six plants in which one may grow and which three or fewer are being mature. That certainly, which I indicated earlier to question D, uh, which were, would be related to investigative costs as well as uh, who would be doing the investigations regarding the uh, compliance with the statute. It would be related to the if someone is not following the statute, who, who is then entrusted to regulate? Is that then the Department of Safety, which then goes, if someone is not doing it, would there be a prosecution, of which I know some of it indicated it's a violation level offense? Uh, who would be then involved in the prosecution of it? Obviously, it wouldn't be the Attorney General's office. That would certainly fall under uh, the cities in which <coughs> are investigating it, but those are certain additional, additional costs. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. you made an assumption anecdotally about the increased use, uh, but have you also considered that if we're going to take the, the uh, pot, put the pot dealer on the street out of commission, where my, where kids get it, I mean, anybody's kids, and that too, uh, what about the decreased use in that regard? In other words, I know that kids can easily find easier to get pot than it does to get alcohol. So, if we have you considered that in the in the, in the use, and also part two of the question is we have a figure that twenty two million dollars was the cost of, of uh, incarceration or prosecution for pot-related uh, items in 2006. You know that amount is higher. That's not your department, though, that pays that 22 million. Isn't that property tax money from the tax property taxpayers in New Hampshire paying their local enforcement ones to prosecute instead of your department? To answer that question, that, that is, uh, let me answer your second question first. That's not necessarily entirely accurate in the sense that many times prosecutions are done either by, there are really three ways, right? There is in the district court, which many times would be handled by the city or the paid town. Paid for by the city. Paid for by the city, no, true. Probably Secondly, uh, there is the county, which would then. Superior court now, su appeal. No, 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 superior court, there'd be prosecution in superior court, which would be handled by the county attorney's office. So misdemeanor level offenses would, handle, would be handled in district court. Felony level offenses would be handled in Superior Court, and any appeals would happen in the Supreme Court of New Hampshire. So, secondly, many cases that are felony level offenses could either be handled by myself, as well as any uh, assistant county attorney, or county attorney, of course. Now, for example, we heard testimony on the other oh, side, I should follow up, uh -huh. that uh, one, of the, one of our members was a former police chief that was arresting people for seeds because they're manufacturing, which is a felony. Uh, Representative Dagg, I believe, was saying that they were arrested a number of arrests when I mean, he was chief of police uh, because that is actually the, uh, the seat itself is manufacturing, is it not? That's I could answer it this way. I've been a prosecutor now for almost nine years, uh, not my entire legal career, but almost that, and I've never prosecuted someone for that as felony level offense. And that, and let me say, that you could say, well, at the Attorney General's office, no, prior to being at the Attorney General's office, I was an assistant county attorney and I had never done that. Has your department done that? I am the drug prosecution unit, meaning me, myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and please, I don't mean, I don't mean any, any humor in that. I don't mean to be flippant anyway. Please don't take it that way. But I am the drug prosecution unit, uh, meaning, so I could say certainly not. Since I, well, since I've been at the attorney general's office. Yeah, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. It seems how you're the whole unit, I'll probably get a common answer out of you. Um, we're hearing a lot of people say that as soon as this becomes legal, 
uh, 21 and under no longer going to be consuming marijuana. In your professional opinion, and the cost of doing business as far as prosecuting, do you expect to see that happen as soon as we legalize marijuana, 21 and under are no longer going to be consuming marijuana? Uh, no. Okay. I think the simple answer to that is to, is to look at alcohol. And, and yeah. we are certainly in a state which has high alcohol abuse for, for young yeah. children. Because part of my responsibility is not only prosecution, I go to many uh, advisory council meetings as well, and that data certainly shows that alcohol use by youth in New Hampshire is, is extremely high. So one can say, obviously I don't have the data, because that data, data is not available, is that it would be similar for marijuana use. I believe that the dots that were connected with that were that the on um, on um, mafia to the extent that it's here would not be able to make a profit out of marijuana once we legalize it and therefore they would go away there would be no black market so would you like to comment on that scenario and since there's n there would be no black market the children couldn't get it I don't think it's fair for me to comment on that because it's not something that would be in my, my sort of frame of knowledge. But what I would say to that is that is certainly a possibility that there would not be a black market for it. That being said, how much would it cost? And isn't that driven by consumer demand? If something is extremely expensive and there's another way to get it less expensive, simple to say that someone would want to pay less for it. On that note, regardless of it being illegal or or not illegal, if like alcohol for under 21, it's illegal and children certainly get it. How do they get it? Well, there's many avenues in which they do get it, which is beyond my testimony here, but it's simple to say it's numerous sources. Uh, Representative Brown. So, Representative Brown, you know, the President of the United States says, well, Mary marijuana is not that bad. He talks to our Attorney General, seems like trickle down now to the attorney general that covers this this district and then you you get a memorandum that says that as long as it's regulated we're probably not going to prosecute but three years from now we have a different administration and you may get a different memorandum that comes down and says well we're not too comfortable with this i i don't see how you could well you get warm and fuzzies over this, or uh, it just just a memorandum. I guess it just gives you guidance. Uh, can you explain in your world getting a memorandum? What does that mean? Sure. Is it a law? Is it you know? I'm trying to understand sure. how you would interpret a memorandum. Thank you for the question. Uh, in in some ways, the memorandum is not guidance to me because it comes out from the U.S. Attorney's Office versus the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office. It doesn't come from General Foster. So it does have, a, what it does do is this. It creates this sort of impression of what role does the state have in prosecution of marijuana cases versus what role does the federal government have in that. And it does not give me the warm and fuzzies whatsoever. It sort of creates a gray area. And how do you then prosecute those cases? I'm guided by the statutes that are created in the state of New Hampshire, meaning if it's a law, and someone's violating the law, we have an obligation. And that's where we fall. Now going, if, now going if a new administration in three years and that administration changes the culture of it, I can't answer that question. I think that's something that is a cause of concern, which I'm assuming by asking the question that you have, and I don't want to put you on the spot, and I apologize for that, but it does cause certain concern that what then happens to what has been done, the laws that have been created that are now illegal. Because it is still illegal. You know, let's, yeah, I should have said that, maybe preface that in the beginning. It still is illegal. And that's sort of, it does not create, create warm and fuzzies whatsoever. And I'm familiar with the, the article which President Obama was quoted. It does not create warm and fuzzies in, in my world. Because in the same breath in which he indicates that it's as safe as, as alcohol, he certainly does not want his children, his two daughters, to use it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's letter, and hopefully you will give us a copy of that. And the reason I am is because uh, we have the memorandum from James Cole, Deputy USAG, dated August 29, and on page 4 in the last paragraph, he specifically includes this qualification, quote, this memorandum is not intended to, does not, 
and may not be relied upon to create any rights, substantively or procedural, enforceable at law by any party in any matter, civil or criminal. It applies prospectively to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in future cases. Is that language consistent with what uh, Mr. Kakavis told you guys? Definitely. It is. It is. It is in the sense that this memorandum was written and then this letter is written saying that, and it's longer, and I certainly can provide a copy. I have a highlighted copy in which I highlighted some of the language in which he referred. I certainly can give that or I can give an unhighlighted copy. It depends we'd on like what. We'd like that and we'd like um, some kind of transcription of your notes that you've been talking about. I certainly can provide those. You don't want to read them because uh, I can barely read them, but what I will do is I will certainly provide a, a written copy. Uh, and to answer your question, sir, it, it is something in which this in some ways created a misimpression, and this being the memorandum written by James Cole. That misimpression was then clarified by U.S. Attorney Kakavis, and I certainly don't want to speak for him because I, I certainly, I'm not even employed by him, employed by the New Hampshire Department of Justice, but. That being said, this memorandum did qualify, in many ways, what was written by Mr. Cole, Attorney Cole. Yeah, we really would like to see that, as well as... And if a highlighted copy is appropriate, I certainly will provide that. It's important to you, I should be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Representative Zepherin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Getting back to the main reason why what we're doing here, so it's your testimony that if we pass this, that there is no savings at all in your department, you do not have to prosecute these people for the law we're just about to remove. And I'm yes. thinking of their kids selling a pot brownie at a school or those type of things that once they go to Superior Court, there's a distribution from that too. What is the actual savings? Can you give us a, an amount or is it just, are all these prosecutors, prosecutions free? Well, they're certainly not free. Right. So in this None case, of there it, must but, be a cost, so there must be a cost. There are costs, and that certainly is beyond my, my knowledge, quite frankly, of what it costs to prosecute a case. But what I can say, in terms of how it relates to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force, specifically to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force and myself, it would not amount to any reduction at all, unequivocally. Mean being, I would prosecute different cases. Yeah, right. So then, but then it's a disconnect, because I'm sure I, I, we, you, you're performing it. You're performing a service, and you're doing a work, and I know that's not free. There's a, there is a cost there somewhere. But again, one of the purposes of this committee, though, isn't, Madam Chair, is right. to determine what those costs are for those dollar amounts. And that's why we ask these departments to come right. here to give us those figures. Mm -hmm. I'm saying is that why can't, knowing that in advance, why do we have no numbers and nothing at all in that case? There has to be something. If we're limiting a, 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 a labor or some type of requirement off these books, there has to be some cost saving because we're paying for these things. It makes sense. It doesn't matter. You can't take something off of the liability when and not have it on the other side. <coughs> if, if, if I'm Zapparetto, I think that <coughs> what we're facing is the same thing as with Health and Human Services. They have a long waiting list for treatment. On <coughs> if we remove some of the people somehow that need treatment, except they think it's going to increase it. Uh, they said if it will increase it, but it will make no difference to their money because they don't have enough money for the treatment they need to do now. They don't have enough money for the prosecution they feel they need to do now. So this will lead to a further workload than one It will, no. it will no. allow them to prosecute more heroin cases or... or That's the answer. That, that would be my answer to the question. It certainly does not reduce my workload one bit. It doesn't because right now, and I can only speak for myself because I am the drug prosecution unit. And again, this is only related to the New Hampshire Attorney General's office. Certainly what would happen in counties, I can't answer because I'm certainly not an employee for them and I don't work for them. But I can say it related to my caseload, it wouldn't make any difference. It would mean that I would do other cases. And granted, that being said, my number of cases involving marijuana is very, very low. I would say it's less than 10% in the year. So that said, I would, I would do other cases, which, would, which I do now. Madam Chair, is there way we can get cases with marijuana seized to this and I wouldn't do all of those cases. Those cases are distributed to counties as well as to the Attorney General's office. Uh, Madam Chair, question of the Chair. Mm -hmm. How can we get figures? Uh, you know, there's somewhere there's a disconnect. When I talk to these county prosecutors, and they tell me how much of their workload is power related, and then we get to the upper level in the state and we find out these costs are very little, somewhere in between that, these 4,700 cases that we had in 2008, has got to have a dollar 
not attached to it. And I, I, as a committee member, I want to know what those dollar amounts are. If we're not getting it at this level, then we've got to get it at some other level because there has got to be a cost. We had one study that shows that the $22 million was spent in one year for prosecutions, yet we don't have anything now. All of our law enforcement is telling us there's no costs here, but somewhere there are costs. So I, if it's not done at this level, is there a way we can get this dollar figure from county prosecutors or someone else or the towns that are spending it? I look at my, my town, how much we pay in property tax to support two prosecutors that are they're, they're, uh, trying these drug cases of which the majority, the large bulk of them are marijuana related. So there's a cost there somewhere, but we're not getting the people in here telling us what the thoughts <laughs> are. That's what I'd like to know, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be capable of doing that, at least not from my county. Uh, what we get is only marijuana only. There are very few of those. What the, all the rest of it, what I believe you're talking about is marijuana with heroin or marijuana with a burglary or mar marijuana with tampering with a witness, which I would wonder whether that's marijuana only myself, but. Uh. I, I, for example, I spoke to Commissioner Poet, who was a prosecutor mm -hmm. in Londonderry. 50 to 70 percent of some of them are small amount of cases. They're paying to prosecute. The attorneys that they employ are paid for by property tax dollars. Well, then, I wonder those dollars. Yeah, well. Yeah. And I'd like to know what aggregate is for the state. All of them? All of them? We have to get all of them. <laughs> Is there some central way we can find out? I have things? worked with my county executive committee for most of the time I've been in the legislature. On, we've tried to get data from other counties on a number of different things. The counties are not organized to provide that data. And I'm seeing a couple of other uh, head shakings on that. So, uh, and that's not just just marijuana that's uh, how many people do you have locked up how much does it cost to feed them uh, how much how much time are your domestic violence people doing etc etc et so uh, we have a fair amount of local control in our counties and the county association does not go into that kind of thing so uh representative keller I believe what you're saying, Madam Chairman, basically is that they don't have enough people to do their jobs, let alone compile statistics for other agencies or whatever it is. So if we gave them funding maybe to do some type of computer systems that would be easy enough to do this, right now everything is on tape as far as comparing Hillsborough, Cheshire, or whatever. They don't have any kind of computer link that they can get back and forth. Well, I don't. I want an aggregate. And they don't even have them. I want someone to give me a total. I'd like yeah. a total. Count. That's what I mean. They just don't have the facility. So we can discuss this one later. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that hmm? what Representative yeah. Saparetto was trying to get at is you're saying in your office it wouldn't change anything. But I think what we're looking at is quantifying that out of your budget right now that $80,000 is going towards prosecuting marijuana cases and in the future we will still be spending that 80,000 but we're going to be spending it doing you know heroin or whatever what I think the representative Saparetto is looking for and I think the committee would like to know is of your budget right now you are doing you said 15.6 percent of cases were for marijuana give us a ballpark how much that's worth I, I know you're not going to reduce your cost because you're going to be now prosecuting other types of cases. But right now, out of your budget, how much of your current budget is being used for marijuana that will now be freed up to deal with other cases, I think? Uh, Quantify that separate? number is something that, A, I don't have, and number two, I don't know that that would be even possible because each case is, is specific on how long an investigation starts to finish, how many investigators were involved, who prosecutes it? Who <coughs> prosecutes it? Do I prosecute it? Does it go to the county? Does the county then prosecute it? There's a plethora of different ways in which the money, it's not a finite number, which I certainly can provide, that would say $10,000, $20,000. I couldn't, I, it wouldn't be fair for me to do because it, it, it just isn't something that, because it, it's asking some, because how many local agencies were involved? Well, how much is that cost? Were the local agencies involved in the prosecution of the case in terms of did they participate in the investigation? Were there federal investigators involved? Well, how do we quantify their cost? Were the state police involved in it as well? 
again, I don't think that's it. It's, it wouldn't be fair. And the reason why it wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be an accurate number, and that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question effectively. I, it, wouldn't be, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't even give you a fair number, and that's not something I should do. I will, and if I could provide the highlighted copy today, I certainly will do so. Okay. Thank you. And I will certainly provide my notes in a more succinct and uh, typewritten capacity. Yeah. And an emphasis, I think, on the, on the numbers part of it, because that's the part that... that Thank you. Is okay. You got the context. Uh, yeah. um, I have a card here that came from the on Department of Safety that you were supposed to be coming in in the afternoon. Yeah, I was con I was confused as uh, Director Bolicki was supposed to be coming in this afternoon, <coughs> so I didn't know if you needed me now or if you guys were going to be continuing this afternoon. Yes, we are continuing this afternoon. We haven't gotten to most of the uh, non-agency testifiers yet. I can. I was asked to be here on behalf of uh, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Sweeney. Commissioner However, Sweeney is drafting more criminal justice papers. So, um, However, I can, uh, I'm, plan here. Yeah, I'm planning on being here this afternoon. Here this afternoon. That's right. Thank you very much. So this afternoon, on. Um, uh, there is, when we come back, uh, the gentleman that New Futures reported that is speaking at a luncheon somewhere right now uh, is um, going to testify for about 10 minutes. Um, uh, Kevin Sabet. New Futures uh, is going to testify on taxation? Yes. Uh, he is going to testify on taxation and regulation. He's apparently a national expert. On um, and on, um, then we're going to go back to to um, the DRA and safety, and then I'm sorry, but then we will get to everybody else. The gentleman that that came, is coming in has to be back at Manchester Airport by 2:30. About so <laughs> we didn't have a whole lot of. We are recessed until one o'clock.